when organizations face poor web performance, challenges building modern applications at scale, or need to reduce operational and development costs, they turn to Fastly. Fastly's distributed edge network means your business can unleash its growth potential without worrying about scaling your infrastructure, whether growth of users, transaction volume, or geographic expansion. Get the speed, security, and edge cloud innovation you need to deliver profitable and engaging experiences. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Fastly for more information or to speak to an expert. Application Security Weekly delivers interviews and news from the worlds of AppSec, DevOps, and all the other ways people find and fix software flaws. Join us as we explore how the latest news highlights modern security practices or reminds us of the missing ones. We also bring insights from interviews on topics from training to threat model, from open source tools to cloud native techniques, plus an occasional reference from new wave to synth wave. Find us at securityweekly.com slash subscribe or look for Application Security Weekly wherever you pick your podcasts. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. You can attend an official cybersecurity summit in a city near you. Listeners get $100 off using the code. I'm teasing you because my teleprompter button was lost. Using the code SECWEEK23, <laughs> you can visit securityweekly.com forward slash cybersecurity summit to learn more and register. Don't forget, on my website, securitypodcaster.com, you can also find links to podcasts I host, uh, some book recommendations, and my ridiculous PC build specs. That's securitypodcaster.com. I also want to plug, I forgot to put in the teleprompter, the Eclipsium Below the Surface podcast, uh, an episode dropped today with Steve Oren from Intel, which was an amazing interview. Uh, among other things, Steve talked about the Intel boot guard uh, process, which, as you know, from the uh, MSI uh, leaks that have happened, there was a, like a microscope under that the past couple of weeks. Um, so Steve, as a representative, and uh, he was, before he's in the role that he's in now, uh, which is more like a C-level higher-up role. He was a principal security engineer. So Steve is an amazing technical person as well as an amazing business and cybersecurity person. Uh, provided some details on Intel Boot Guard, which I greatly appreciated, in addition to providing a lot of insights into the hardware supply chain. Uh, so that's all. And today we interviewed uh, Rami Hussein, who's an amazing cybersecurity leader, um, and uh, works in higher level security positions uh, in the financial industry and also had a great discussion about <clears throat> more generic kind of supply chain stuff uh, as well. So that's all on Eclipsium's Below the Surface, eclipsium.com forward slash podcast is hey, where you can find all those. Sp speaking of which, yes. um, Finite State Podcast, IoT, <clears throat> the Internet of Threats. I heard they interviewed some guy named Larry Pesci. Yeah, I know. It was pretty good about the future of medical device cybersecurity. Mm. Yeah, it was fun. It was a good time. It was That's a good awesome. Time. We talked about uh, new omnibus bill. Well, the the omnibus bill, and that the FDA has a whole lot of new powers uh, coming up pretty soon here. Yes, that is actually extremely significant, Larry. Yeah. Um, our mutual friend Josh Corman. Yeah. Was yep. one of the folks that did amazing work Absolutely. in that area, which Absolutely. is funny because I talked to Josh this morning. I like just bastard. catching up. Love Josh. Yeah. I haven't talked to Josh since he was here in the studio in a long time, and it was yeah. just in passing. But. Um, but, oh, along lines of podcasting, too, not not my, one of my podcasts, not one of any of our podcasts, mm -hmm. um, Microsoft Blue Hat just announced uh, that they started a podcast, and I just Ooh. subscribed. I have not listened yet. The link is in the show notes. I've not listened yet. I promised a, a review on that, like, whether I do on the show, whether I do that on my new blog. I'm like, ah, I got this, like, new found little new shiny, like, yeah, new shiny thing, um, but I do intend to listen to it. Uh, Dave Weston is uh, w on episode one dave is uh, what is his title he is a very influential person on microsoft um and microsoft like security type where is that uh i don't remember what story it was um but i've been trying to get dave on one of our podcasts uh as well oh blue hat podcast what story number is that story number 12 blue hat? your story number 12 right Yes, my story number 12. Oh, your story number 12 tells me it is, uh, what if we have a sock puppet? puppet? Uh, sorry, did I read the number wrong? 13. 13, thank you. So 13, Dave Weston is the vice president of OS security and enterprise at Microsoft. Yeah. 
So I, I'm anxious to uh, to listen to that. Uh, also, I think Vis, yeah, Dan Tentler is on one of the episodes as well. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I'm excited about that. Dan's good people. Where do we want to start this Say evening? hello to our new host. Oh, yeah. Hey, who's new? You got a bird in there? Oh. Lee. Oh, I thought Jeff had visitors uh, on the porch in the <laughs> in the cabin. No, Lee Neely is here with us. Lee, welcome. Ah, good to be here. Uh, wonderful sunshine day outside. Uh, the uh, funny thing is that the, the, I had a choice tonight between going doing the podcast or going to the ball game that got postponed last night because of rain. Mm. And you chose because it's starting to rain, I decided this was a better choice. No, uh, actually, I decided to do this much earlier on. I have call. to get up really early tomorrow. I don't have time for a late ball game. <laughs> Lee, <laughs> glad you're here. One of the stories we had in common, Sam might have had this story too, securing PyPy Pi accounts via two-factor authentication. Yeah. So we, we talked last week. I don't know if you were here last week or not. I don't think you were. I wasn't. So we talked last week how PyPy had basically shut down for a period of time. I don't think it was that long. Mm -hmm. Like we covered the story, and by the time we talked about it on the show, it was back up. It was probably back up, but they did shut down for a period of time due to like air quotes malicious activity, which is not surprising. There's been a lot of shenanigans with a lot of these uh, software uh, package repositories, PyPy being kind of in the the sights right of a lot of attackers. Then right. coming in this week. You and I and others potentially had this story where, and this is something we've talked about, they are requiring now for every PyPy package maintainer must use two-factor authentication before the end of the year. Did I get that right? Yeah. So, you, the, yeah, you have to do two-factor authentication. <clears throat> you can do like Fido or you can do like the authenticator app for TOTP. Hell, I'd go with the Fido app. Uh, it's better than... Non, non phishing resistant. Plus, they're talking about adding um, limited download windows. I mean, or upload windows rather, where you can limit activities. Um, they're really raising the bar. Huh. Um, their whole goal is that you know that when I'm getting calls package, it's really the version that Paul uh, committed, not something that I went in there and, and messed around with to create, you know, a pseudo Paul package. Um, and since it's not enforced, I would say. Get out there, turn it on, because you'll have a little while where you can turn it back off if it's not working right. Because when you get to the end of the year, it's too bad, so sad. It's on or it's on, your, your choice. I agree. I agree, Lee. Set it up now. It use it. If you need to switch with which method works for you um, and test it out, like better to do this early. I also, I know this is very like contentious issue. However, I believe that it was like a necessary thing from the PyPy Pi, uh, package maintainers to do this. And like, I get both sides of it. I don't want to force open source developers to do things because it kind of defeats the whole purpose of open source. We've had guests that talk about how open source is like a rock that you leave on the ground or a head of lettuce that you leave on the ground because it has some kind of expiration to it, right? Yep. That anyone can pick up and they can build the wall and make a salad, right? right. So to put requirements restrictions around the rock that i just left there for anyone to pick up mm -hmm. and like whatever they do with it is like whatever i make no guarantees about my rock to say that i need two-factor authentication yeah. to be able to leave hey, a rock in the woods that, like, that rock may but, be uranium right? that's right yeah I, I somewhat object to uh lee referring to it as really raising the bar though because i mean it's 2023, <laughs> we should be doing two-factor auth authentication just about everywhere. So I think it, it is the bar. Right. I agree. Raising Actually, the bar I from agree the current Jeff. state of reusable passwords is yeah. what I really mean. Because they, gotcha. they weren't enforcing it. And, and that, I, th I agree with you. In 2023, we should all be using good MFA. Um, but I just want to commend them for, make, for moving the bar in the right direction. Um, I'm actually surprised they gave folks as long as they did to, to implement. I mean, I'd be like, how about by August? Yeah, how about by next week? But I, I, I yeah. think it's easier and more maintainable than it has been ever before. Like, I remember a time when the, like, the Google Authenticator app, you had to like jump through hoops to get it to transfer between phones. And if you didn't do that, like oh, yeah. you could have you could have a bad be day. A pain in the ass. Yeah, now it's super easy to transfer. Like, I get a new phone and it just it, it transfers, and that's what I use. And... Setting it up in the back end is super easy. Like if you set up a, a WordPress site, 
you, you get a thing and it's, you got two factor authentication. And so I'm like, now every time I log into any WordPress property, I use two factor and it's not, it's not a huge deal. And it's not the end all be all security measure, but it's way better than not having it. Right. So right. there's right. that. It, well, it stems off a whole right. swath of attacks. Right. And it, but it's not impermeable. Nothing is, but it definitely helps makes you more resilient. Well, and and then on top of that, we have you know the 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 Fido like the YubiKeys have. We had a case where a user wanted to use a reusable password with a you know password manager and all these things around it, and the cloud provider is like, really, we'd rather you have an OTP, and we do support Fido. I said, yeah, you can use that YubiKey you have. And less than five minutes later, they're like, oh, it's all done. We're good. Right. Yep. Drama done. No more problems. Hello. Well, even if you do that, I'd like to go one step beyond. Take a look at my story six with Discord, because in Discord, they hacked into it just by getting people to put a shortcut in their browser and they stole their token. So apparently, mm -hmm. even if they're using 2FA, they then don't have anti CSRF tokens. Oh, so you can just steal. Interesting. Which, and that would be true of everybody, right? Even if you have your, your FIDO system. What kind of mm -hmm. cookie do you use afterwards? That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Like this was right. like the old sidejacking stuff that we used to see, Paul. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, with uh, you know, Facebook using HTTPS to log in, but every subsequent access was over HTTP. So just grab the user's token off of the unencrypted Wi-Fi over HTTP, and Bob's your uncle. But you shouldn't be able to use it, even if you can steal it. Right. Anti CSRF is not that hard to do. Nope. Yet I didn't think. I thought everybody got this memo because this doesn't even <laughs> annoy the user the way two FA does. I mean, uh, well, they need to raise the bar. Clearly, security's hard, Sam. Security's hard. That's right. <clears throat> but there's a lot of session. I mean, the I guess I'm not session tokens down. are being <laughs> are being you know bought, sold, and traded I'm sorry, on Lee. <laughs> on underground okay. forums. So clearly, oh, not no. everyone guess the message of the extra layers of protection you need to prevent a session token reusage. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, Hal, remember when we first started doing uh, SSL, we were only doing the trend, the sensitive transactions. Was it the rest of the website? Didn't. Yeah. Right. Cause it was computationally yeah. expensive. Right. Yep. And so then, um, so then we had, and a it shift. took a long time. Well, yeah. So then it, then there was a shift and we started with all this SSL offload with crypto processors that could do the stuff really fast at the server yep. side. But then we had this advent of this wonderful thing called a smartphone mm. and the processing power on the smartphone wasn't the same as like you'd have on your desktop PC. So the mobile version nope. of the site or the app or the API on the mobile side didn't use HTTPS. Yeah. And then they tried to do the elliptic curve cryptography and then the NSA might've had the hand in that. And, you know, just, just saying it's, it was a story at the time, right? <laughs> and that's what we're uh, using now. To curve. What's that? That's what we're still using now, I think. Well, the, the, the particular algorithm that was, pro, uh, uh, that was, that was pushed for, yeah. for mobile phones, exactly because of what uh, Larry was talking about, was sponsored by the NSA. And there was some suspicion that they had, uh, uh, what, what would you say, pre-calculated it all? And uh, put in effectively the, the equivalent of magic parameters so that they could they could mm -hmm. decrypt it well. And Josh, what that, that was, was a, that was over the cellular network or was that over the the IP network? That was uh, cellular. Okay, yeah, was I think that was cellular. Thing. Yeah, it was a yeah, cellular. cellular. And yeah, that that may have been along the lines of the stories around um, Hikari back in oh, the day. God. Yes. Do, yes. Do, do, Josh, uh, do you remember the days of uh, Hikari being on the stage at Shmukon? Uh, talking about uh, being able to pre-calculate all the A51 crypto tables, key tables, and that mm. they were made available as rainbow tables. Shmook on. And, there, and I remember the story, and there was a little bit of uh, tinfoil hat brigade from uh, Twitchy, Twitchy Nick at the time, mm -hmm. who was friends with Hikari. But after he gave that presentation, he kind of disappeared from the scene for a bit. Mm-hmm. Years. Years, years and years and years, and I thought. And there were rumors that there were a couple of different organizations that kind of wanted to keep him quiet. Hmm. Hmm. And it wasn't government. It was organized crime. Hmm. 
Now, I would argue really? that it was probably government that ended up doing it because if they want, if organized crime wanted to keep Akari silent, he'd Cement end up na- he'd end up naked in a ditch in Mexico somewhere. Mm-hmm. The government, not so much, um, mm. because they didn't want that. <laughs> I mean, let's give. Some governments, the benefit of the doubt, I didn't say which ones, right? Uh, well, I mean, you know, it comes down to people, too. People are people, whether you yep. organize crime or whether you're the government. There's yep. good people and bad people, yep. right? But, I mean, but mostly organized crime is bad but, people. But, but argu- I mean, that can be debated, too. But yep. arguably, this he, isn't an organized crime he, podcast. He is, he is still amongst us uh, under the Daystar. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, does a bunch of whole sorts of fun stuff. Still. We need to get him on the show. It reminds me yes. we need to get him on the show. Yes, we do. Um where was I going with that? Now I don't, now I don't remember where we were going with that. Oh God! Where, I don't so, remember. Where, I certainly don't remember where we came from. Two factor from keys. Well, we were Sam talking about two awesome. factor. Bye yep. bye. So pie we pie. went from two factor to CSR pr- uh, proof, which kind of backed me into my number one story because not because of the story itself, but because the need to keep up with technology and as things change, which we were kind of talking about, you know, the scope of SSL. Beyond the two-factor, making sure you don't have stealable, reusable tokens and, and that sort of stuff. My number one was about the Expo OAuth, where they had deprecated methods that were that needed patching because they had a vulnerability, which is probably why they deprecated, but people were still using it. And the, to me, that comes back to our conversation of how do you make sure you're staying up? You're not falling behind on the security measures because you're, you know, of course, time to market's everything. I get that. But is that a non-trivial problem or is that... We're just going to have to suck it up and figure it out. I think it's just table stakes now. Like, that's just, unfortunately for open source developers, this is just table stakes. And they're going to have to, because of the increase in malicious actors going after this vector, it's just something we're going to have to do, which is kind of, you know, unfortunate to, to put that on open source developers. But again, I, I, like, I mean, I like Jeff's point where... If I stand up a WordPress site or I log into my bank or mm-hmm. I log into any of my social media accounts, mm-hmm. it, it, it's you, you configure two-factor. Now, years ago, that was more of a pain in the ass. Today, it's a lot pretty, better. Pretty simple. But you, you should do it for yep. a whole host of reasons. And again, well, it's not perfect. <laughs> it's not But perfect. the raising the bar element is, I think it, I think it has more to do with the... Um, the demographic we're talking about, you know, developers, they're notorious for uh, not following any of the procedures or policies because they're just doing development. They just want right. to get something working. They just want to get something Especially running. open source developers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Gonna, they've got a sprint they need to finish. They need to have these features done. Done. Or I've got some code that I wrote. It was for me, but I'm just going to share it so other people can use it. Yep. Like, I don't know. I'm sharing it. Like, well, it's open. It's free. It, like, it's, it's, whatever. it's even beyond that. Paul, you write something really cool that I embed in my app, and you manage to update it to stay current with security standards. And I'm being lazy; I don't go implement your new methods, so I'm mm. using the old stuff, and I get right. tipped. Right. And, and then, the, oh, so you've and you've, I have the gall to blame you. Yeah, yeah. Really, that's how you've works. seen IoT firmware before. <laughs> Good lord. <laughs> don't yeah, but uh, there's there's on the on the opposite side of things. I I, I would chafe at the using the word lazy there is certainly probably a laziness factor but you know i think it's much more often the what you were just saying you know you got to get something out you've got a deadline and Mm -hmm. you don't have to do it you're just trying your your job is to make something work and and in theory it's somebody else's job to secure it in oh, theory, crap. I got. I, well, I need to get this feature out the door, but I probably should update this library because of the security vulnerability. Should not must. Right? Yeah. Should mu- I should? Yeah. But I got to get this feature out, and if I have time, I will update the library. But if I update the library during this sprint, it will potentially break this feature and this feature. Yeah, well, well, then shit. I got a regression test to make sure it doesn't. Yeah, right. I want to do that. It's not well, laziness. It's I. I got to get this out the door. Yeah. Oh, but you want yeah. to talk about shitty software? I'll grant. I'll, I, I laziness. Was Do we want to talk about your choice. website now, Paul? Yeah. Well, there's that. <laughs> of course. Wow. So is there some, is wow. There like a Again, it's not winning awards what for we, style, right? What, what's Sam staying in there? Is there like a compliance standard for software where you could put some mark on it to show that you have made sure that you're not using old vulnerable versions and you have an S bomb and that stuff? No. 
There should be. There is not. There is uh, not. Much, I, I, I mean, something like that. I mean, software is all unique snowflakes. That's I mean, why. my my stuff has that little stamp from McAfee that said it's secure. I'm gonna hit yeah. you so fucking hard. <laughs> yeah, but like also, like not all vulnerabilities have a CVE that we can map to right. either. No. So there's. Well, sure, it wouldn't be perfect, but still, it would be something. You could choose an open I mean, source yeah. pro project that had this thing, or when you integrate it into your stuff, you could beat this standard, and then you'd have some level of security. But then, right. Sam, then there's just shitty software. I mean, <laughs> well, like my story number three, NCC Group did. Um, uh, an analysis of Pharonix Insight, which is a feature-rich software platform. And if the features were vulnerabilities, they're knocking it out of the park, <laughs> let me tell you. Deployed on-premises in features schools. Features usually introduce vulnerabilities. The application right. enables teachers to administer, control, and interact with student devices. It contains numerous features, including allowing teachers to transfer files to and from the students and remotely viewing the contents of student screens. Mm. And another there feature. There's 11 more features in the form of vulnerabilities were identified. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that include uh, DLL hijacking, remote code execution, um, bypassing enhanced security mode, virtual host routing, uh, teacher, teacher console credentials exposed via API endpoint, and my favorite is the ninth vulnerability on this list, which is keystroke logs are stored in plain text in a world-readable directory. Like, you almost Yeehaw. have to try to be <laughs> that incompetent when it comes to software uh, security and lack of controls. And you works. can just imagine as you read through these 11, even just the high-level descriptions of these vulnerabilities, you can just imagine that there are students out there going, crap. Like you, why are you disclosing all this? Now they're going to fix this. I was having so much fun, fun right. reading what other people were typing and logging in as the teacher and monitoring other people's and screens because their credentials are, credentials are exposed via an API endpoint. Yep, and all, all those other places they were logging into. Like, hey, they were they logged into their oh. school Gmail account and there was Good a keystroke Lord. logger. <sighs> the, like, hey, where you could profit. I mean, shenanigans. You know, I mean, if you had permission, <laughs> Jeff. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know why it took me so long to think of this, but there are, uh, there are compliance, uh, standards, uh, associated with software in PCI. They, they've recently, uh, retired what they used to call the payment application data security standard. And now they call it, I think it's just the software security standard. And it, so it's so designed speaking to be of story five. Yeah. Hold developed. on. You're jumping. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm you're segueing. Jumping. You're just, you're jumping. No, that's jumping. not a segue. That's jumping. I wasn't done talking about how terrible this software is. All right. Now I'm done. Well, <laughs> but, but, but software is terrible. Is, All right. No, no, no. There I'm done. is at least in one area, a, a pretty stringent software security standard for a very specific type of type type of software type of application. Mm -hmm. So it does exist. Um, might it be something that could be adopted uh, more universally? I, I can't speak to that, but uh, it's certainly a, a starting point. You know, for, Paul, for how I, and I'm th just thinking about this now. For how many years did we used to shit all over PSC, PCI? Shit all over it. Like it was. Like, uh, it's been around for twenty, almost twenty years. So I'll say mm, twenty years. Yeah, I mean, but now so wait, two but, things happened. It got better. Uh huh. And we got wiser. Yeah, it got more, better. It got definitely got. got it definitely got better. Point two could be debatable. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> and and you know, I, I think I think about where we are current state. Jeff, you had did you have a story about uh, PCI four? No, I had. Uh, I had Paul's a story. Well, I put a story in there for Jeff. Uh, my story number five, PCI DSS 4.0, how to delight the auditors. And to me, just reading the title, it was kind of like it should have been called how to cheat on your PCI DSS assessment, <laughs> which is not, Ouch. shouldn't be cheating on that. You should, no. you should, you should do that. Right. Right. Um, but it turns out like the article and Jeff, I'm not sure if you read it, right. This is you know, oh, I've your, read it. your world, but. To me, it was more about recommending how to do things correctly, yeah. not how to cheat. Thankfully, uh, when I read yep. the article, it was like, like, no, you should take this seriously. You should align it with your business goals and include the right stakeholders 
And yeah. um, you know, if you're ready, if you're if you are to be audit ready, changes need to be infused across the daily architecture mm-hmm. of the way the teams are operating, make reporting a daily habit. It was pretty sound advice, yeah. Jeff, in the article mm-hmm. about how to take it seriously and do well uh, and be compliant with with PCI DSS, which I think is important. No, I, I agree, Paul. I mean, my the only thing that I object to is their prevalent use of the word automate audit, where technically the the PCI process is an assessment. Yeah. Now, agreed. you know, what's the difference? Um, you know, I, I can remember when I first started in the private sector 25, 26 years ago, and we were developing methodologies of how to evaluate organizations to try to get them to build a security program and, and you know, take security seriously, which is, you know, oh, by the way, a topic for this blog, you know, for this podcast for how many years we've been doing it now. 18. Um, uh, Going into 19. You know, mm, I, you know, we had come up with, you know, the, 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 the group that I was with, we'd come up with sort of a five-step process, starting with an assessment. And the assessment often would involve you know, because it was cool and sexy and it was based on the movie Sneakers, a penetration test. But more often than not, it was a vulnerability assessment. I, I used to ask my clients, do you want us to find all the ways into your organization or do you want us to just find a way to break into your organization? And they always said, well, we want you to find all the holes. And it's then it's a vulnerability assessment, mm. not Right. Not a pen test. Um, you know, do that sort of get you know level set. Find out what you're working with. Then design a program. Implement the program. Um, I think design, architect, implement, and then at some point audit to see how well you're doing, and then start all over again. So the you know once mm-hmm. you've done it a couple times, the difference between an audit and an assessment, you know, the, it, it starts to blur. And and, and frankly, mm-hmm. that's where. You know, I've had clients now for you know eight, ten years doing PCI. Yeah, it becomes more audit-like, where you're just amassing a whole bunch of data, you're collecting a whole bunch mm. of documents, and all that kind of stuff. And it can become very rote, which I, to me, is a perception of an audit. Why do we have to pull all this data point together? Right. But like, what yeah, the are you still is, doing these things? Yes, we're still doing those things. Okay, good. Right. Can you prove it? But, yes. Okay, good. But, mm-hmm. I mean, PCI, since version 2 was released, which was way back in 2010, has mm-hmm. been trying to stress, which is what the article is talking about, uh, at least in part, this is not something you do once a year for two weeks before the auditor or the assessor, the right. QSA, mm-hmm. goes. This is something you're what? supposed to be what? doing no, all the time. No, no, Blasphemy. It's a, it's a three-week process. Three weeks, man. Three weeks. <laughs> Depends on what you need. Fifty percent longer when you do it Joshua's way. <laughs> That's because Josh charges well, by the hour. I was. The PCI I is, like that they're saying this is how to bake it in. You got to bake like it in. The yep. audit yeah. connection, but the bake it in, and fundamentally, this would this would be true for any framework you're using, whether it's PCI mm-hmm. DSS, NIST, ISO. If it's not baked in, if it's not part of the culture, and you're just doing this stuff all the time. You're just playing games with whether you call it an assessment, an audit, or just waiting for the hacker to get in there. It doesn't matter. Well, it's got to be cultural. It's got to be at the core. And the article, I don't think necessarily, I mean, it says it, but I don't know if it, 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 it resonates with somebody that's not familiar with it, with the process. But when you bake security in, when you bake the processes in so that people are doing the right things and are, and are collecting the right data and doing it on an ongoing basis, mm-hmm. when the QSA, when the auditor shows up, it's a relatively painless process. Now, now, um, right. and, and Jeff, did you say Jeff, something... In, I'm go-, go ahead, Jeff. I'm I've got a sort of a question around that, and you know, you, mm-hmm. ba- you you need to bake in the what we're trying to do for security based on PCI DSS and all this type of stuff, and you're trying to have you foster a culture of security. But yeah, my question sort of is is, and this was one of the things that I always saw when would start to drive me nuts that folks would try to limit how they'd bake in that security by, quote, limiting the scope of where they thought PCI applied. Do you see yeah. f- folks still oh. trying to do that cheat? Like, oh, no, we don't oh, have to worry absolutely. about PCI over there because it's not in scope. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it, it's the worst thing that ever happened to PCI was when people started latching on to, wait, if we don't have credit card data there, we don't have to do any of this stuff? 
I mean, I, I used to have arguments with clients years ago when they were trying to first limit the scope uh, by saying, well, what is it exactly that you're not doing that's basic uh, security practices mm. that you don't want me to know you're not doing it well? And, and, and there were some legitimate answers back in the day, and there's, there still are. It's It's hard to make sure that patches get out to all the systems in an organization you know think of a nationwide retailer that's got uh you know we talk about endpoint security and we've got fancy new names for it but every cash register in every you know let's pick a you know target they were breached how many years ago so you know target walmart national chains every checkout lane in that store is an endpoint yep and you've got and you've got a You've got to collect logs from that endpoint. You've got to make sure that there's patching on that endpoint. You've got got to have some sort of we used to call it antivirus. Now it's anti malware endpoint protection. You got to have that running on every endpoint. And not every lane is open at every store all the time. And you and, and you might have maybe the systems are down. And you might have multiple devices that are processing credit card information at each each mm-hmm. one of those lanes, such as the reader itself, and then the the. Uh, the system that's doing this, the scanning and the tabulation and... Well, not to go way off on a tangent, Larry, but, I mean, for most of the history of PCI, the card reader is an ancillary device plugged into... It used to be a serial port. Now, more often, it's a USB port. Well, it's yep. still maybe and a serial. And potentially serial but or it, USB, right? right. You know, the, op, the point of sale is the cash register, which is the PC, and that's where the focus is, and oh. everything that's plugged into it there's not good away. ways. There's not good ways to scan those things. There's not w- good ways to assess them or audit them from a security perspective. There's not a good way to push out configuration. Mm. And not only are they ancillary devices, they're more often than not, um, you know, uh, uh, essentially, um, uh, mm-hmm. gosh, I'm blanking. On, appliances. Yep. Uh, you know mm-hmm. what we would Appl- consider appliances, appliances with the little lock on the UI to you know they're secure. Yep. Right. But. Yeah. Um, I want to reel, reel us in from the it's tangent. Hard to, yep. It's hard to do security well in a retail environment. And, and before, you, before you reel us in from the tangent, I had to look it up. Tiger Team mm. was wow. released two episodes. That's all? What? what? Two episodes that's in, it? Two, in 2007. And both, it was the, the car dealership and the jewelry store, yep, and that was it? That, that's it. Two episodes. Yeah, um, and they were both released <laughs> Christmas night on 2007. Only a few days before uh, Court TV turned into True TV, oh. and it was listed as a burn-off pilot. Wow! They did the two episodes. So it's like a two-episode pilot. They, they, produced, basically, they yeah. produced the two episodes, and that's all they ever intended to do. I think I remember talking with Nickerson about this, about how pretty terrible the experience was. Yep. But mm-hmm. I mean, those guys are awesome, and they, the two episodes were awesome, and. It earned them a ton. Well, we made fun of them a little bit, but yep. it, our, it was all in like tongue in cheek. They earned a ton of respect in oh, the community. I mean, I, I, it I, inspired people like Vlad to get in the field, and yep. I'm sure Vlad's not the only one. So even though it was only two episodes, and then the network got sold and yep. it got canceled, like mission accomplished. It's, and you know, and, mm-hmm. and I got to tell you, of the three folks on that show, Chris Nickerson, Luke McGomey, and Ryan Jones. Yeah, I don't know Ryan Jones. I do. He's a nice guy. But the well, other, all three, the, all three of them are awesome. The, the other the two, if you, if we went to them with a problem because we've known them for years, they'd give you the shirt off their back, their pants off their legs, and then hand you a hundred bucks and say, you know, I love you, man. What right. else can we do to help? We gave each other a lot of shit over the years, and it was yeah. all in, all in good fun. It was yep. awesome. Right? Uh, well, they did the Exotic Liability podcast. Remember the, those? The, 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 I, I can rem- I can remember. My, my dream is that podcast comes back. I can, I can remember. I mean, you could never air that podcast today. I, but yep. I, can, I can remember years ago, you know, obviously we had a relationship with Nickerson. My first time ever speaking with Luke mm. was at the one of the Ken Shoto parties at DEF CON yes. in the Skybox. And he mentioned that he worked for McAfee. And he worked in the AV department, and I'm like, your shit sucks. <laughs> I think I remember watching that dude like pick a lock at <clears throat> DefCon at our party between the two rooms, yep. with everyone standing over his shoulder, yep. and like pop the lock open like he had. It was no, yep. I'm because like, there was another so there was respect. another party going on next it door. It was the 303 party, and we, next, o- we we opened we the doors. Yep, yeah. And then I went and sat down with um, Zaz and uh, Joe Grant. Oh, I. Did. Wow, that <laughs> yep, was. Tangent. I remember that. I remember um, that. 
Way, okay. way to go off on a tangent. We were talking PCI. I we know. were trying to get away from a tangent. Well, anyway, Paul wanted on. to vector us to some other story. I think my story is number eight. Show you into my story number five. My story number <laughs> eight and nine. Okay, go for uh, it, Paul. CVE twenty twenty three twenty eight seven seven one unauthenticated command injection vulnerability affecting the WAN interface and several Zixil. Zixil. Yep. Zixil. 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 That's the way I say it. You. Well, I mean, you work for Finite State, and you do this stuff all day long. Zyxel. So I'm going to say Zyxel because you did. Zyxel uh, network devices, as reported by Trappa Security. Caught through all the FUD. There's a lot of, I mean, there's like articles from Bleeping Computer and like all these other things. Um, don't read those. Uh, read <clears throat> the one that I linked to mm -hmm. in my so there, story number a, nine. There's a, uh, Story number eight has the... POC. As the proof of concept exploit, which is awesome, mm -hmm. but to understand what the exploit is doing, you got to read story number nine, which isn't even the original research, but Rapid7 basically broke it down. Essentially, it's a lot of sending the right um, IP packets, uh, IPsec, UDP, UDP port 500, yep. uh, IC packets to trigger the right code that inside the C code eventually gets you to a mem copy that doesn't check the, the boundaries. <laughs> That's essentially what it boils down to. And what that gives you, I mean, you should go read the article, but what that gives you is a one packet remote code execution buffer overflow that drops you in a root shell, which I think is awesome. Because yep. we don't see that every day. <laughs> much, maybe every other day. I mean, we, yeah, we don't really see, yep. I mean, we do see it, um, but it's, I mean, that's really awesome. Yeah, we uh, oh, we, so one of cool one of my uh, my coworkers and I both have a problem, and that it's we love to scrape for firmware. Yes, you do have that problem. Uh, it's a good problem, and it, it's, it's something it's, good to be a. What's that? Yeah, what's yeah. that? It's like uh, it's like hoarding, a digital hoarding. Yes, uh, and I got out of that for so long. Like I got rid of but so now much you're stuff. In the, you're in the firmware. Uh, I have. Love firmware. I have, love me some I currently firmware. have four terabytes devoted to collecting firmware. Oh, I love it. It just it makes me. Zyxel you know. was one of the most recent acquisitions. <sighs> I'm just, it makes me <sighs> excited to hear you have four terabytes of firmware. Well, I don't have four terabytes yet. Oh, okay. You have four ter allocated. I have allocated. Well, and, and I, have, I try and send it, you as many sites. I sent you some not a while uh -huh, ago uh -huh. to help and, you and, with and your And I've four. sent you some back. Yeah, with some some habits. We have habits. Yeah. <laughs> We fuel each other's habits. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. What? What? So we, my oldest and I were having this conversation, and we've had this conversation off air. Like, Dad, are you sure you don't have adult onset ADHD? And, oh no, I'm and, sure and, I have. And, and, and I it's said, official. That and I said, implied onset in adulthood. And and I said, why do you ask? And they said to me, Well, Dad, how many knives do you have? I'm like, a lot. Uh, uh, we don't ask this kind of question. That's like asking now? Jim McMurray how many bottles of whiskey. Draped over the chair, Ex exactly. You know, in the closet. Yeah, exactly. What do you mean? We like, don't... I need a scope here. I exactly. We and... don't ask Paul how many cigars he has. We don't ask Jim McMurray how many bottles of whiskey he has. We don't ask Larry how many knives he has. Like these are not oh, conversations because they could get back to our wives and it would be a bad. More day, importantly, okay? <laughs> more importantly, you don't ask me how many knives I have. You ask me how many hobbies I have. Right. Because <laughs> that's just that's, the, that's the key. Yeah. How many domains do you have? Oh, see, we don't. We don't talk I, about. Like I said, I can. We don't talk how many about hobbies I have? And believe it or not, I I looked that up today because someone asked at work, specifically the same guy that says that collects firmware. And he says, anybody pick up any good dot zip for domain names? And yeah, I said, I, said, yeah, I got I a had, couple, a couple hundred. I, and I had to go look, <laughs> and I picked up four, and that brought 100. my grant. No, only four, and that brought my grant total to one hundred and ten domains. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh huh. I picked up, uh, let's see, uh, Mac OS update, firmware, Raffle, and sbomb.zip. Mm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> anyway, Lee, I think we should you, segue to... tarball.zip. Oh, uh, someone did. Yeah, tar someone, posted, someone posted that. Uh, but, Lee, on the Zixil thing, we also had Mirai botnet. Was Mirai Zixil? Was Mirai taking advantage of the Zixel or there was new ones with oh. Mirai? And you had that story as well. I though. thought it was the, it was taking care of the, uh, well, it was DB link, I mean, uh, DBI, NetLog, and Zixel. It actually had three. And this is the, the, um, it was one the, of them. Uh, yeah, the Zixel one was one of them, right? Right. And it took care of two others. And I was trying to figure out whether this, what, what they were doing with, did they have a separate, 
package for each of the three vulnerabilities or could th these things do all three and therefore you know find your zixel then find your deep your lb link and then find and just move through any of these vulnerable routers i feel like be Lee, really cool i'm glad you pointed this out because i feel like Lee, that remember back in the day when a vulnerability in an exploit didn't get attention and love until it was added into metasploit and no one wanted to be like the next shit my vulnerability now has an exploit in metasploit and it's a bad day for me i feel like mirai mm -hmm. is that of the iot world except the iot vendors still don't care <laughs> that if mm. it's in mirai like it's there's no stick like it mm -hmm. should be a stick but it's not a stick. It's just a fake stick like they use in the movies. It just really hurt when you yeah. get hit with it, you know? I mean, part of the thing that caught me on this story, not just Mirai, was it was Unit 42 reporting. And they yeah. they always do some neat research. I know they're not alone in this one, but I always, when I see Unit 42, I need I know I need to go look at it because it's going to be cool. Um, and uh, apparently, I didn't, what I didn't know is this variant is like the most active Mirai variant that's out there. The one with the IZ1H9 variant. I thought Mariah wasn't really a thing anymore. I'm so much for my naivete. Uh, it's amazing. It's, it's going strong. Isn't it amazing how much Mariah has just lived on? Like, cause you know mm -hmm. what it was? Well, they open sourced the code. I mean, they just released the code to the world. Like they wrote this heinous worm for IOT devices. And I'm like, that's awesome. Like that'd be super bad if that code got out. And then I'm like, oh, <laughs> look, there yeah, it is hey, on GitHub. Look at that. And then I'm like reading through the source code. I'm like, oh my God, it's basically just like default passwords and yep. Minor Payloads exploits for every different yeah. architecture. Like Larry and I predicted that shit would happen, and here we are. And yeah. we say that a lot about IoT stuff, but mm -hmm. Mirai then has just lived on, lived mm -hmm. on, yeah. and just but keeps when, getting updated. In, you know, in the last segment with Vlad, we were lamenting how you know common password conventions like the season and the year are still a thing. Why then does it just surprise you that something like Mirai has variations that live on? Not, mm. it, you know, I guess it's not none surprising. of this stuff seems to get fixed. It's which it is somewhere not, is going to segue into your art, article, Paul, on uh, the the uh, I forget which number it is. The one about is cyber cybersecurity a solvable problem? Yeah, no, it's a great point. It is, we well, don't have to do that now, right? But, but like know, we'll get to that. Mirai is not surprising. As it is depressing. Yeah. And like the reason why I think one of the reasons why Larry and I work in firmware security today. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because none of this shit surprises us. It's just, it's more, it's more of the same and it, it doesn't mm -hmm. change. So we, we, we have to work to change it. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and, and, and the irony, the irony, Paul, is there's a very interesting conversation we were having at work today. Uh, while I would say I work in firmware security, I think my role of the company has even expanded in the last you know, number of months that I do not work in firmware security. I work in artifact security. Artifacts. Ooh. Meaning that's Android, that's Windows executables. Any sort of binary, that's the type of security I work in now. You're the Indiana Jones of security. That's why you've- Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> it's Larry Whoa. Pesci, artifact security. <laughs> That's I, right, ladies. I like, I like that. You need a hat. That's what I have, I'm saying. I, I have multiple. You have, but, but dude, uh, dude, remember, AD, adult onset ADHD. I'm a completer now. I have man, many hats. I have some Goran. You wear many hats. You wear many hats. I have some Goran and brothers. you have many hats. I have some, ba totally I have some baseball hats. I have I got a nice cowboy hat. I've got a fez. You know, like and you need a whip. Just saying. You got. I got, Ooh, I got where'd you those. get the fez? Where'd you get the fez? Do I need? I don't remember. It just Indiana showed up. Jones fedora. Yes. It. Just showed up one day, like I was going through boxes, and I'm like, "Where did this come from?" I think I got it in college at some point. And <laughs> yes, Lee, that is a prompt to get your uh, your uh, Indiana Jones fedora. Oh, for sure. Uh, oh, where are here, we going here, with that? Here, here is now we're breaking out hats. the leather top hat. The quad. Let's talk the, about some other things and exclusive. save the. The, uh, the shenanigans the for the end of the show. I, I know well, one. Is cybersecurity an unsolvable problem? Let's I, save that. Yeah, for yeah. I oh, know, you want to I save know, that one? Okay, I, so Larry, go next. I know. I One of your stories that I just noticed sure. that you had in there, uh, your story number two from Dr. Neil Krowitz. Yes. Find my AirTag. 
I there you go. As my lack of description, I skimmed this story like quickly. I saw that he had a really cool Apple AirTag case, which I'm totally jealous of. Yep. That he he made. Totally. He made he told he made Total. this and like dyed the leather himself. Totally easy. Totally. He, I he mean, was, I, he's the man. Ask ask me about my hobbies. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's. <laughs> Yes, this is something you would do totally. I think it's something you have done probably. Uh, I, I have. I I probably don't have that. Did you leather. read this whole this whole article? I I did skim it, but and I, and part of the reason why I skimmed it is that I wrote the section on Apple Air Tags for the Sans course. Yeah, uh, I, I and, added and, this just for you, Larry. And basically. we talked about some of the tools that mm-hmm. I put together for spoofing and doing detection of mm. Air Tags under Linux, and so forth. So yeah. The one thing that I learned from this article is that the MAC address changes every 15 minutes or mm-hmm. 30 minutes, I think they said, uh, every 15 minutes. And I did not know that. And that's interesting. So uh, I'd have to go back and, and double check that. But how, do, how does that work? I don't know. I'm not exactly sure. So I, like I said, I've got to go back and do that. But yeah, absolutely. Um, the Find My Network is pretty fascinating. Mm-hmm. And I, I just taught uh, the wireless class for a group of students in the the greater Singapore time zone uh, last week while I wasn't Mm -hmm. here. And there was some questions that came up about the AirTag stuff, and it was, well, like, this isn't a big deal because no one can find the stuff. Like, yes, they have a worldwide... Like, the the AirTags themselves have no location data on it. It is the fact that the air tags are nearby a device that does have location data and can triangulate. More importantly, they're probably nearby tens of devices because mm-hmm. the iPhones are the sensor network mm-hmm. all over the planet and is compatible with Android. Uh, so Android could also be part of that sensor network. If it's running the app. If it's running a specific app. Exactly. Um, you can create your own air tags um, through uh, some very inexpensive open source software. Yeah, you give a whole tech segment on I this. Did. It's, I did. It's amazing. And the one that came up a couple of weeks ago that I don't think we covered, and I may not have even put it in the show notes, was that you can send arbitrary data over the Find My Network. So if you customize Ooh. your own AirTag, you can send arbitrary data, which will pop, be populated throughout the Find My Network worldwide. Oh, C2 communications with air tags. Ding dong. <sighs> Bing Man, dong. that that's a good that's a good segue to the unsolvable article too. <laughs> kind of sounds like the Morris worm. Can we talk about that now? Uh, all right, we can talk about that. <laughs> you have my my blessing. Well, only if we cover more stories afterwards, right? <laughs> yeah, we'll, yeah, we can do, we can do more stories. <clears throat> um the title was intriguing. Mm-hmm. The unsolvable. What was the full title? Where is it? What is my story? Now? Is, oh, is cybersecurity an unsolvable problem? I mean, awesome title. I mean, most yeah. of us looking at that title have been doing this for any given amount of time. We're going to click on that. Yep. Right. And is it, the, was, is, so, it the, is it the four so, C's of information uh, security? Post, no. post <laughs> poll. Just real quick. Yes. No. What's everybody think? Just to that question. Round round the horn. Is I mean, you got to think it's solvable. I'll, no, I'll start. I think it's, I'll, an ongoing, I'll start. it's an ongoing effort. I say no. No, it's unsolvable. I mean, wait, is cybersecurity an unsolvable problem? Yes. I say yes. yes. Is it an unsolvable problem? Yes, meaning it's unsolvable. No, meaning it's not. And yes, no, meaning, meaning it's it is unsolvable. unsolvable. Oh, there is that. I would say no, that, that no. unfortunately, that is a, def- a definitional issue. Yeah. Because define cybersecurity before I can answer that. Well, we're going to get to that in our discussion, but mm. just knee-jerk reaction, yes or no. I, I, I will argue that is cybersecurity an unsolvable problem? My answer will be no. Okay. It is not an unsolvable problem. I think it is an unsolvable problem. Interesting. I think right. we were talking about this earlier. In, so today, this is my answer, but the... There. When we look at other safety issues, other safety issues like we have in electrical systems, mm-hmm. like in your home, I was mm-hmm. giving an example. I'll spare the detail. I'll give you an example of like circuit breakers and GFCI plugs. Yeah. Yeah. Great safety measures, right? Like mm-hmm. literally saved 
significant physical harm and or death. Yeah, you can no longer throw, you, can, you can no longer throw the toaster in the bathtub because it will trip the GFCI. Right, things like that. That wasn't the, my use case. But have you but, tested that, Larry? Okay, let's not. We're getting off topic now. <laughs> if we look at things like, but we look at things like fire safety, right? Yep. Or other electronic safety, like your television, UL standards, making sure my TV doesn't catch catch fire. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, within the own electronics, those are very much static environments that we have to provide some level of safety in. Right. When we transfer that and we move to cybersecurity and we look at hardware firmware software networks they're very dynamic and very complex which achieving solved in in that case is impossible hmm. well and i agree with josh i think at some point we need to start defining and and putting boundaries around the terminology in this very loaded question definitely like like what is subs what is cybersecurity? I will, so I will I will also argue, and the, there's a reason why I answered the way I did, is that I mm. think there also needs some to be some definition around the word solved. Yep, I agree. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Solved because, for an amount of time, or like how much are you mitigating right. that problem? Now, going back to my previous examples, we still have electrical fires. Mm -hmm. We still have regular like fire fires mm -hmm. right we still right. have electronics that, that malfunction but they're reduced to a point where it's not a pervasive problem so i think it's uh, unless, somewhat of an unless you happen question. to be a citizen of canada right now because they've got wildfires going on all throughout the country you just ask us how we know this because all that <laughs> smoke is in new england right now well i is was in really? Can i was in canada a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. and and that was the talk. Of, I was in Calgary, and that's where the early, you know, wildfires were somewhere in what is that province, Alberta. Um, I, I actually had a little bit of an epiphany in the last week or so because I've been asking people, uh, like many of us do, what is cybersecurity, especially since I grew up in information security, and this may not be news to anybody. Mm. It, you know, I'm I'm slow sometimes, but. I think a, a beginning of a good working definition for me of cybersecurity is when you look at, you know, in the old days, when I started out at this place, you know, we did information security for the government and the classified networks. And, and it was all about keeping secrets. And it's we're all about familiar. the information, Marty. It's all about the information. And, and we are mostly all familiar with the, the concept of data security, mm -hmm. confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Mm -hmm. And I think most of us would, you know, we embrace the keeping secrets part, the conf confidentiality part. And that's Co largely what our industry has been focused on. Um, what I think begins to help me understand what cybersecurity is, is the fact that technology has advanced to the point where we're no longer simply looking at data in the sense of, uh, you know, sensitive data, private data, personal data, um, research data, proprietary data. We're also looking at things that the technology has introduced, which is metadata, uh, location data. There's uh, other types of data and there's other things that, you know, it's become much more of a thing now, just a, the concept of availability, which you could argue is the availability of data, but more so these days, it's the availability of systems and technology. Mm. And that's where I think I begin to under okay, cybersecurity is is something that encompasses all the new stuff that technology has introduced. It's not just data security or information security anymore. So that's one kind of thought that I've had in the last week or so. But traditionally, I think uh, you know, again, going back to information security or just security, I think that there's there's two different viewpoints. There's one viewpoint where a lot of the attention is on all the technology and the systems and everything we talk about, about secure configurations and patching and updating and stuff like that. There's there's this idea of security is securing the devices, securing the systems so that they are as up-to-date as possible and has every known vulnerability and known weakness addressed, let's say. Mm. And that's that's security more of a, as a state. So that's a noun. 
But then there's this concept of security, which is a little bit more ambiguous, which is uh, all the things that you do to monitor and detect the and try to discover the bad things that are happening or the bad people that are trying to break in and do stuff or the things that they're launching in terms of malware and and ransomware and and denial of service attacks and all that kind of stuff that's something that you do i mean i've said for a long time that security is a verb it's something that you do it's an ongoing thing um and I think this gets to what you're saying about the safety uh, analogy that you were using earlier, Paul. We, we've we've done a lot of the, you know, securing the state or, or creating a, a state where fire safety is something that you, you do all these things. But then you still have to have, I mean, how many people have smoke alarms in their house? And how oh, many yeah. people... How many Dude. people would live without a smoke alarm in their house? Smoke Even alarms and fire got... extinguishers. I mean, smoke alarms and fire extinguishers, mm -hmm. right? But you bring a great right. point. How many people truly have smoke detectors and fire extinguishers and have enough of them to protect mm -hmm. their homes and provide the maintenance on them, which means they change the batteries, they swap right. out the fire extinguishers when they expire, and the smoke right. detectors, you can only swap the batteries out in smoke detectors so long. There's an expiration date on the smoke detectors themselves. On the smoke themselves. detectors, yep. and you have, to, you have to swap them out. So, I, yeah, I, so it's I, very I, analogous I, to cybersecurity. I, I will admit to being able to do all three of those. Oh, my son's into <clears throat> welding, mm -hmm. so I have to keep up on that stuff because I am like really paranoid yep. uh, about that. And if you watch the TV show, remember This Is Us. If you watch that show, mm -hmm. you will absolutely yep. like go, "Oh my god, I have to check all of my smoke detectors right now." Yep. Well, that well that happened. We had one smoke detector go off in our upstairs, and it went off, and it was like some ridiculous time in the morning. They always do that. Always, but, always. So the what, did, what did I do? I went and replaced every battery and every smoke detector in the house. Yes. Because that was the appropriate thing to do. In any case, this article, you know, though, uh, is kind of isn't interesting. Isn't the violin cheaper? You can just play while the place burns down. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> On the deck of the Titanic, yes. The, the yes. title is very catchy, but yes. the article is actually about a book yeah. um, written by Scott Shapiro. The title is Fancy Bear Goes Fishing, The Dark History of the Information Age and Five Extraordinary Hacks. Now I P, have to say like PH fishing. PH fishing. fishing. Yep. I had to say like I I would like I wanted to write this book. Like I was like, mm -hmm. oh my God, this is like so awesome. Now I want to read or listen to this book. I can't say the title. I would have left out the fancy bear goes fishing with a PH uh part of it. Um I think that's a little it's a little weird. I mean, yeah. you're talking about five hacks, but it's like you're referencing one, in, in, just one in yep. the title. And I mean fancy bear is fancy bear. I think that individually the the hacks don't some of these were make cool. a convincing enough argument i think in total is really where i can see this book uh shining right is is picking the five not just picking the one and putting that one in the title i mean they start the article with the morris worm yep is arguably you know one of the first big big ones um do they ever get around to listing what the five are uh, one they of do. them is do we have to uh, read the book? Dark Avenger. Uh, Infamous Bulgarian hacker known as Dark Avenger, whose identity is still unknown. Uh, Carmen LaCroix, a 16 year old uh, from South Boston, notorious for uh, Paris Hilton sidekick 2. Yeah, remember that? Like we covered that on the show. That was like one of the first episodes of the show. We covered that. Yep. Uh, Paraz Jha, a Rutgers student who designed the Mirai botnet to get out of a calculus exam, mm -hmm. which I didn't even know that that's how it yep. um, <laughs> nearly destroyed the internet when he hacked Minecraft. And of course, mm -hmm. uh, Fancy Bear by Russian military intelligence. Which is, with for, the record, for the record, that is only four. That's four. four. And, Mar and Morris That's is the fifth. fifth. Oh, four Morris is the fifth. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, you I have. Thought a Morris was the first. Well, anyway. The, well, it was yeah. technically the first. You have, a, you, for have sure. a, you have a link to Amazon. It is available via Audible. I was ahead to a credit. Yes, they were it about is. to expire, and I ordered them. Already. Now, they interviewed the author, and the last question they asked the author, Scott Shapiro, is. Do you have a favorite hacker among those you wrote about in your book? And he says Robert Morris. Huh. And I want to agree with them, but and I I mean I get both sides of this. And you have to understand mm -hmm. the full story and the dynamics of where Robert Morris's dad worked at the time, the loss, the the criminal charges that were brought against them, and how all that played mm -hmm. out, uh, which is in that book Cyberpunk. I put it in Discord. By John Markoff and, and uh, Kate, uh, Kate, Kate Hafner. Kate, yeah, Hafner. I, I read that book when it came out. Yes, dude. And so that, I was in high school. You got to like, 
there's a lot of reading you need to do to not a lot, but a set of reading you need to do to fully understand that story. Even understanding that, it's hard for me if I were to be asked that question to pick Robert Morris out of that one as my favorite hacker because mm -hmm. I feel gypped, much like Clifford Stahl. In both cases, <laughs> I feel gypped that they did initially some of the most groundbreaking and amazing work in mm -hmm. our field that inspired mm -hmm. many of us to work in this field, but then mm -hmm. they did not pursue in into their careers in, in what was then to just right. information security and then cybersecurity. Yep. I want to see a whole, co like you, you did like uh, Cliff and, and Robert Morris both did amazing work in the beginning and it was like a one and done. Like what would have happened if you had had an amazing career? in this field and put everything you had uh, it's into interesting it. that you bring that up paul because um i i you know we for a while uh, you know the last several years on the show we we tried to bring in some of the the yeah. pioneers and we've interviewed a bunch of them we have. and i know you've got the the hacker heroes is that what it's called mm -hmm. series still in the can may or, may or may not ever be published who knows um, there's some analogies there but you know <laughs> In the early days, you know, I get approached all the time, you know, trying to help out with, you know, career paths. You know, I, I, sure. when we were B-Sides Charm, I helped out with the the career track. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, the people at the beginning, like Cliff Stahl, like Robert Morris, they were just, you know, and so many others, they they had a job. They were, right. you know, there was, there was no career path. There was no educational track. It was just this stuff started happening. I'd throw myself into into that that category as well to some degree, um, and, and many of the people that I think are I respect the most and are truest to their their legend, if you will, they did as you said. They did what they did, you know, one and done. But they kind of they kind of like looked at it as like, eh, I. I you know what's Cliff, Clifford Stahl? He's an astronomer. I don't know. Yep. I know Robert Morris Jr. has gone on to do other amazing things. Oh, he's an amazing uh, uh, computer scientist. Dan he, Farmer. He taught, at, he taught at MIT forever. Beats of Venema. Yeah, you know, yeah. The, we interviewed the authors them. of Satan. Yeah. They went back to doing what they, did, you know, they were doing. You know, Spaff is still and continues to be a professor, and he likes teaching people. Um, you know, I the ones that got into it and stayed. Uh, largely are ones that started a company and became filthy rich multimillionaires and then disappeared. Mm. Like, do you remember the name of the guy that wrote ISS, Internet Security Standard? I know this. It's not, anyway. it's not May. Is it Mayfrey? It's not Mayfrey, is it? Mark Mayfrey? Nope. No. Nope. Uh, no, I don't remember. And of oh. course, now that I ask the question, I'm blanking on his name. Oh, uh, God, the teasing. Chris, Chris, Chris something. There's, um, there's people screaming. Uh, overcash. Overcash? No, 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 no. No. But, okay. but you know, um, he founded a company, ISS, got bought Chris by Klaus. IBM. Chris Klaus. Thank you. I knew it was Chris something. Um I don't know what he's. I don't know what he's done for the last twenty years, other than sat on his bankroll. I, I I would like to think that the the people that are the greatest in the field, that have the up, utmost respect, the pioneers, the the influencers, whatever we want to call them, are not ones that simply started a company, became an entrepreneur, and got filthy rich. That, there's there's got to be more than that career path mm. to be able to be labeled a success or you know whatever mantle you want to put on them. I, I mean, that's just a personal thing. Yep. But, hey, Je Jeff, I want to... I want Between your last story and, and sort of the commentary around this one, I mm -hmm. feel very triggered, and it's a, and it's a good kind of triggered. Um, okay. Because I, I want to share something with the audience that I think... You know, is important to me, and and part of that is I and I feel triggered in that um, it feels very much for those last couple of stories about uh, Arthur C. C Arthur C. Clarke's three laws, mm -hmm. and yeah. most Asimov's three laws. No, Arthur C. Clarke's three laws. Not the, laws no, not not the three laws of robotics. The Clarke's oh, sorry, three my laws. Bad. Yeah, different different three laws, and, and opportunity to educate. Right, Josh. So the, the, hey, one, the one that we are probably most familiar with is any uh, sufficiently advanced technologies into oh, magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. My bad. Sorry. Yeah. But the first two, 
When a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. That's mm-hmm. law number one. Mm-hmm. Number two is the only way of discovering discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. Yep. Both like nine of nine impossible things before breakfast. Like to me, both right. of those things Six. talk to those last two commentaries that you had. Yep. Very very true. Oh, number um, three is awesome though. Yep. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Yeah, I do it, want to say though there are, but there are, you know, it's interesting. There are some that are very much on the academic side. I think sure. Belavin and Chez, right, wrote the mm-hmm. seminal work, Catching the Wily yep. Hacker, mm-hmm. in, but yep. continued in careers that were at least adjacent or, yep. you know, crossed those lines in their computer security. Although they're very much computer science and, and very academic based, kind of they kind of stuck with it. Um, and I'm just. I don't want to, I'm not knocking anyone. Like, I'm not bitter about it. It's more no. disappointed that some of the people that inspired me to get in the field that did these awesome things in what we now call cybersecurity, like, mm-hmm. just didn't stick with it. So, and that's, I, I would well, argue that it's not well, that they didn't stick with it. It was that there wasn't a lot of runway for them to go with it, probably, at the time. Mm-hmm. But there was, I mean, there was a huge amount of run. Look where it came from then until today. I you mean, know what but, I mean? But, but they didn't know it at the time. No, that's true. Maybe they're yeah, too but, early. But to find to find the runway, I mean, what are you talking about in terms of runway? Are you talking about oh, it's getting dark? I'm getting mysterious. Well, there's the research runway, and then there's the the product uh, like, runway. I mean, there's multiple like, runways. Like look at Clistol. Like his runway disappeared once they solved the problem of who was stealing the pennies worth of accounting time, and he went back right. to being an astronomer because yeah, that's what but, paid that's what paid his mortgage but maybe yeah maybe that's what he wanted to do maybe maybe they it was too early where yeah. if it had happened later i mean not too much later but later a little later on he would have been like oh i should create a deception company but like yep. that market didn't even like it did, like exist. it, it was it was just one it was just one thing I, that happened that, right, right. like i i got to go figure i got to solve this one problem i solved this one problem now i'm going to go back to astronomy because there are that problem was solved and there are yeah, another yeah, one yeah. of these problems but uh, but uh, so I, mean, I but again, oh, Jeff, a different ahead, idea. Lee? Lee? Mm-hmm. That is, you know, we've had a lot of hacks since Morris and and the stuff Cliff stole is, but of those, who are we talking about by name? We're talking about Morris and Stoll and a few others. They left an impression that's like they left a legacy forever. Uh-huh. Yeah, and that's amazing. That we're still talking I don't know about what they could have done, but yeah, hell. this many years later. <laughs> The legacy doesn't pay the mortgage, and I think what you're getting at, Paul, <laughs> yeah. is how, how you know. do you make a living? How do you right. make a living right. off this stuff? And I, I would like to think that there's more ways to to get satisfaction in life, make a living, pay your mortgage, pay your bills, without going the entrepreneurial route. But it just seems like, I mean, I've been to, I've been to how many places in the last couple of years talking to young people, and their aspiration. Uh, I was at a college two falls ago and uh, meeting the cybersecurity students at this college and their aspirations were to someday become a CISO. Right. And I was yeah. like holding, holding back the, the chortle. I'm like, really? That's, that's your aspiration. But and I mean, wow. also, and, and, hold on, hold and, on. I, I want to, I, given that Sam's in higher ed, I want to ping sort of Sam's feel for that as well. Please. Oh, I don't know. My students are adults. That's still, yeah. but they still have aspirations <laughs> and they still have dreams. Well, I don't know. I my role is quite humble. They mostly just want to like get a promotion. Yeah, uh, but could that be the promotion to CISO? I will, but I, I will maybe. maybe. But I yeah. will say though that close up this topic that I think Stall is in Morris' unique positions. Yeah, from what I understand, and I don't know either of them personally, that Stall's kind of like a. Woo, free love hippie time yeah, he's, he's eccentric like eccentric how many eccentric because yep. i don't want to take it away from he's the guy he's super smart guy i'm not saying he's a bad guy in any i've never heard any no, negative no. things just like, like it's like diffie it's like, like, like yeah. diffie, Hel- diffie and helman they created this amazing right. encrypto technology and they were on acid the whole time but well, that, that's yeah. my understanding right so. but so all right so that's that's all but morris i think because of his where his dad worked and stuff like i imagine it that like people dressed in suits came to him and said you're not going to do any more of this computer security stuff anymore right 
right? Because we're yeah. watch, watching you, watching mm-hmm. you. You better go teach computer science and not do any of the security stuff anymore. And he was like, yes, dad. Yes, yes, guys. With yes, the, federal the, agency. The federal yeah. agents from, from three-letter agency. Yes. That's, I don't know. Again, that's just how I envision it. Well, I mean, when I write the, the days, script for the Paul, movie, that's how it's going to play out. Back in those days, Paul, you know, the hackers that were, you know, breaking into things and getting caught, they were more often than not getting hired by the places that yep. they got broken into, that yep. they broke into. They were lighting um, themselves on fire, which is part of that and, whole Cliff or Soul story, too. You know, but uh, I, again, uh, you know, from a. You know, a legacy perspective, that's one thing. Uh, and all these pioneers that we've talked about, they're pioneers because they were the first. Right. And, and, mm-hmm. and, uh, but they, they learned, you know, because they didn't grow up in the field, it wasn't a career path. I think a lot of them just went back to their passion and what they yeah. really liked doing. This was just sort of a, you know, it, a fleeting hobby it, it, experiment. It, yeah. It, it, well, it, it was new. I mean, you know, the, it was something that they stumbled upon and they figured it out. You know, they 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 all had you know that inc- they all had that hacker mentality of you know trying to solve a puzzle, curious how does this work, what are how mm-hmm. far can I push the envelope type of thing. Oh, great uh, segue into go. my story number four, where Eclipsium mm-hmm. researchers stumbled into this thing and realized that Gigabyte firmware was using a windows platform binary uh table and basically enable the back door in a explain, whole explain. bunch explain so ah, and i'm not the best at the technical details when it comes to windows platform binary table so let me describe it in somewhat layman's terms uh Paul terms yeah firmware like uefi firmware can install a binary that windows then takes without much verification uh, and creates a running service. So like from boot up oof. in UEFI, UEFI goes, hey, Windows, you should take this thing and you should run it. it. I think it's a, with administrator privileges and makes it a service and goes, you should run it. And doesn't know anything about that. And involves eight CPI tables as well, which is more mm. like magic oh. pixie dust. <laughs> and then that service can run with system privileges and do whatever the hell it wants. Like download more programs and execute those on the system. And and run them as a service. And run them as a service or run them without any further validation or Uh. use SSL or not to download said said software or use a domain name or just a host name you know to download those extra stuff that run on your system i mean it's, it's essentially i mean it very much is a backdoor i i, I i'm reminded by uh, some applications that were written by a former employer of mine well before i was an employee there mm-hmm. servify this mm. from in guardians and it was basically take any application and turn it into a service right Hold, except like this service is installed by the firmware. Like this could <laughs> be up your like, system. Servify yeah. this. Like yeah, it doesn't work so much anymore. But how about an update? This this yep. could, that could be awesome. This, this does this does just that. Oof. Um, and again, uh, understanding how the I mean, it's basically I mean, it's not a backdoor in every system. It is a mechanism to install a backdoor uh, in every Windows system and depending on the implementation, like again, once the firmware has enabled this module that then installs a Windows service, it's kind of up to the uh, provider, uh, typically the the OEM, like um, a gigabyte, to determine what protections may be there or not be there. And in this case, my assessment, it was particularly bad. So the dropped in our description, right? The dropped Windows executable is a .NET application, downloads and runs an executable payload from one of the following locations. The first one in the list is HTTP something. So no, mm, no, no SSL. Uh, yeah. The next one is an HTTPS um, with a, a, a fully qualified domain name. The third one on the list is HTTPS, but it is just a host name, software-nas, meaning... <sighs> You don't necessarily, in name resolution, have to uh, do DNS resolution. You just need to 
resolve the name. So that could be an internal name, which means you don't even need to do like any kind of DNS man in the middle or, yep. or stuff like that. Um, so uh, that's all explained uh, in the article. So it's not, it's living off the land, right? This is like taking it. So this functionality is designed by default in UEFI and in Windows. This is documented functionality. In fact, we've talked about Windows platform binary tables before. Um, and I kind of deem it as a gift that keeps on giving, except that the gift is given to attackers or pen testers to utilize this functionality to be able to execute code on your system. And the end result is attackers are going to execute code on your system. Mm. Uh, the, my team at Eclipsium did an amazing job uh, writing this up and, and, and spelling it out there and, and discovering these uh, particular vulnerabilities. And there's a full list of affected models uh, available uh, as well. And so there was like a lot. So people were like, well, am I running Gigabyte? I'm like, I don't know. Are you? Because the supply <laughs> chain is super complicated. So while your major manufacturers, I don't want to, I'm not picking on any major manufacturer. What I'm saying is that your, your HP, Dell, Lenovo, being the three largest manufacturers, yep. have a lot of oh, SKUs oh, yeah. in their product line, right? Hell yeah. And not just active SKUs, but they've got thousands and thousands, maybe millions yep. of SKUs that they produced over time. Some of those could be all kinds of different. They could be a, a cash register. It could be a PC that was made to like produce displays on mm -hmm. walls. It could be very special purpose. They make, they make lots of computers. And, and, those three and, manufacturers make lots of freaking and, and computers. And 13 different SKUs for one of those computers that it, display different models. Dis, the display stuff based on RAM, CPU, right. art. Yeah, yeah. Maybe in some of those, they went to Gigabyte and said, mm -hmm. hey, can you provide us the motherboard with that? And yep. by the way, can you do, like, you know, do the firmware with that? Or maybe we work together on the firmware or whatever, yep. you know, wherever the case may be. Uh, I've described in several presentations and even on the show, like some of the complexities in the supply chain. So yep. the moral Mike, of the story is like, you got to go check. Like, I've, do you have Gigabyte? Yeah. You're like, well, I'm an enterprise. Like, I don't run gaming motherboards, but do, do you have Gigabyte? Do you? Is a question you got to be able to do, answer. Do yeah. you? Like, yeah, because there's more than just your enterprise PC. You've got these mm -hmm. display units. You've got the, the fire alarm system. You've got all of those types of things. And this is where a supply chain really comes into uh, effect for some of this type of stuff because you don't know where some of the stuff is coming from and what is white and I'm going to say white boxed be, but we don't use the that color anymore what is resold right, right. yes exactly yeah pa yeah it's all packaged together in a complex yeah. supply chain also yeah. the <clears throat> the mitigation I know I've talked with Tyler on the show about this when we covered it um, months ago and uh, I asked some of our researchers internally too, and you can disable the Windows platform uh, binary table mm -hmm. stuff in Windows. It's not straightforward, and from what I've read and what the Eclipsium research team has told me, you know, matches up. I'm like, but aren't there like you can disable it, but it's like not really disabled. Like there's uh, ways to turn it back on and stuff like that. And they basically kind of, from yeah, what I recall, kind of, said, kind of yeah, like, that's yeah. kind of the case. Like it's not just a go to this register saying turn it off and like you're done. Like they're, of course, you can turn multi, it back on. The attackers and, can turn it back on. Yep. Like the, there's the whole thing. So can, can my grandmother turn it off? Like it, yeah, yeah, no, definitely, definitely not. But even in an enterprise, like it's, it's tricky. And if you turn it off, and you're relying on this mechanism for your updates to happen for your firmware, uh, it, it could disable that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there's all kinds of shenanigans going on. So, great post um, hey, by I, our I've research got a, team. I've got a story that uh, I want to touch of Sam's. And, in fact, Sam had it posted twice. Because it's so it's good. It's, it's so good. Posted twice. Uh, Sam, your story number three and 17 Cyber uh -huh. weapons manufacturers plot to stay on the right side of the U.S. Uh, you're right. Yeah, so, I mean, this is um, the Israeli company, Paragon Solutions, and they looked at what happened to NSO. NSO sold, they made spyware for governments, and they sold it to all sorts of oppressive regimes, and they got banned in the United States, which destroyed their company, pretty mm -hmm. much. So what Paragon did was, before selling to any customers, they courted the American government and now they're selling to American government agencies. Oof. Making the same stuff, you know, remote control 
software to spy on phones and other devices. There's a market for that, like any other weapon. But uh, you have to stay in good grace with America if you want to survive. Mm. Well, and if you want to sell to anybody, you better not pull what the... Uh, and if you want people to actually work for you, because remember, there's another Israeli company <clears throat> who their, their people are on, more, are on more blacklists than you can imagine. Yeah. 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 It, it, fe it feels like so much of the Israeli cyber community is kind of sketchy, scary. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, really, any, I don't want to single out. No. Israel as a company that a country that has questionable companies and or people that Agreed. are doing nefarious things Agreed. in cybersecurity because that's every country. Sure, every country. Um, it feels like a hotbed. Uh, it, well, NSO did you know definitely yeah you I know, mean, contributed to well, that that hotbed. So, well, you know I, I would argue that Israel is a hotbed of cybersecurity uh, security type products. It is also on our sensitive country list, so we're. There are a lot of restrictions on commerce with Israel. Well, and this is not new. I mean, how long has Checkpoint been around? And that was a big, huge issue, what, 20, 25 years ago when Checkpoint was becoming the number one firewall, but they were an Israeli-owned company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Sam, you had something you want to say in there? Yeah, I'm thinking, you know, it depends on the culture. And it seems like Israel has a culture where you can just uh, move fast and break things. And I, I relates to my story number five, which is talking about China. And what they say is in America, if you survey people, a lot of people, like 65%, are suspicious of technology and worried that it might lead to some kind of disaster. Whereas in China, it's only 20% that feel that way. The other 80% feel like this is great. Just make more of it. It's wonderful. <laughs> and at least in China, they say the reason that happens is because their totalitarian government covers up the consequences of disasters. They had a radiologic Ooh. disaster that killed people. And they just covered it up. They just covered up how many people died of various diseases. So the normal people are not aware that there have been disasters that come from their technology. Huh. Yeah, you know that that article is bullshit, Sam, right? Well, I thought it could be. I don't know. Okay, Maybe so let, me, let me explain. Forgive me. I'm being yeah. a, little, a, a little inflammatory. The That's idea fine. that China covers up disasters, absolutely correct. The idea that... Yeah. Uh, there are major problems in 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 Chinese uh, infrastructure and, and industry. Absolutely, no complaint there, no argument there. However, China has better AI regulations than the U.S. does. Yes, they do. They they have multiple AI regulations about privacy, security, and they are viciously. They actually pulled every AI company they could find in China into a, a forum with the government and basically threatened them with death. Literally, by the way if they fuck it up. So while it is, uh, the aftermath in China is gonna be covered up massively in, uh, in, the, in terms of regulation, they're much better. As a matter of fact, Chinese AI companies are fleeing to where there is no regulation about AI. Do you know where they're coming? Here. Here. <laughs> That's interesting. I'd like to see an article about that. I did not know that. Uh, I'll put it up in a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a matter of fact, the EU um, has a regulation that is disincentivizing open source AI people from working there because they require in the EU, they require you to follow GDPR and, and various other things uh, so that it is quite literally, uh, where is it? Dang it. Um, well, that, that, that they're, they're, ba they're basically making it harder to build AI in mm -hmm. the EU. So... Um, it's they're also fleeing here uh, oh there we go okay so um uh F it. i think that this should put the links in properly oh damn it no wrong hang on i'll i'll, I'll get some links wrong well you know this I, we certainly is the wild west of ai in america there. And that's in my story nine, caught my attention, where this guy decided to find out which books ChatGBT had been trained on. Apparently, wow. the training set is secret, but he just would give it a quiz. He would give it like a sentence from the book with a name missing and say, fill in the missing name. And yeah. it could only do that if it really had access to the text. And it found that it's been reading tons of copyrighted books, science fiction books, okay. and that would seem to be a violation of uh, 
of copyright uh, something like that. It's that also like telling. It's also that's telling why the AI, are class but it's action also, lawsuits. But it's also that's telling why the AI how to right now against every AI company for image, text, and code. Yeah, but it's also that's telling the AI how to take over the world. Like it's giving it a blueprint. It's like, oh, that was that was interesting. Maybe I will well, create Skynet. Well, only if it understood the books, which I think right. it does. No, right. I, but so but, my wife had the news on, and they had someone talking about how. Uh, there's that whole initiative. I think we talked about it, right? It's all those famous and smart people that are like, we need to take a time out. Right. AI is going to take over the world. So yeah. finally it got enough attention where it's on the Today Show and they're interviewing someone and they're like, AI is going to take over the world. It's going to be just like Skynet. And he's like, yeah, it's going to be bad. Like this, we need to pay attention to this Well, there now. was, uh, I, I was watching a similar news program. I think it was just this morning that, that in the last day or two anyway apparently there was an open letter written to the u.s government that was signed by yeah, like all Elon sorts and, of yeah, yeah. industry leaders and and yeah. the letter was really short it's like government you know u.s government please regulate this yes and and many signatures including people that are you know ceos and founders of a lot of the ai companies yep they're all on board with this which is funny that you know you know this technology gets you know, invented and and somehow becomes popular and and becomes better maybe, and and all of a sudden, well, we've got this all this possibility and this capability and it can be so disruptive. Hmm. I wonder if we should regulate regulate it in some way. When has that worked in mm. history? I, I mean, don't know. But, I, I, mean, I, mean, like, I we, think what they're talking about though is regulation because it's going to become sentient. And from the AI experts that we've all talked to, I'm sure like. A long way away from that no, is what I and no. I'm not an expert, but again, I don't think it's simply this the idea of it being sentient. I think it's the the economic impact that it, it that is too. like no to that have. too, and and other applications like you know you already can use AI to find medicine by simulating protein folding, so you could certainly use that to design bacteriological weapons. All right, sure, and you could use it to make convincing deep fakes and better disinformation and there's just going to be an awful lot of i see so it's not the sky it's not the skynet thing it's the other yeah malicious uses no, it's, of, it's of it's almost AI. circum it's it's uh, to me it's almost circumvented or or uh, you know we we're, we've somehow blown past the discussion we had a couple years ago when you sent me to that ibm conference to meet watson and you know the whole idea of the the machines are going to take over the world and it's the skynet and uh what's the other movie the um um it's Terminator. latin no um deo ex machina yeah ex machina yeah, ex, ex machina. Ex machina, yeah. You, know, it, it, you know and i read an article that's still out there somewhere that you know talked about you know this is this has been a theme in science fiction for a long time you know the idea that machines take you know become smarter than us and can take mm -hmm. over us and you know the classic example uh, that's older would be data on Star Trek Next Generation that you know is right. you know smarter than all of us processes things much better, um, but is but is benign. And then you've got the other extreme, the Skynets and the Ex Machina. But the the whole AI thing, it, it's not a matter of them being s sentient as much as it's it's a capability that is going to be so disruptive to that the current economic. A lot of people t could lose their jobs because it could be done by AI. And and and, and Jeff, I, so I just hold, hold, hold on, up. hold on, uh, Jeff. I want to up you, one up you with with data, and while please. not not particularly uh, a cybernetic thing, that you go into the next season of Star Trek and you start talking about the holographic Doctor with uh, Voyager. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that arguably yep. that the doctor on Voyager became what was his sentient. Ah oh, crap! Yep. Shit! But Captain uh, January, dude, dude, we binge watched yeah, Voyager shit. seven of nine. No, that's uh, no. We binge uh, watched. We binge uh, watched Voyager. The What's the doctor's name? I just want to point out that um, somebody Google Regi it. Reginald. I just want to point out. I don't. No, that not Reginald. That was that no. was that was somebody else. That was, I just want to point out. There's a listener that gives a shit because when we talk about AI, we completely delve into science fiction. Yep. And I do want to point out that that the listener does have a point, and that we call it science fiction because it is it is fiction. Right. 
And but it's also science. I am working on getting uh, AI experts that maybe have a dotted line or something into into security uh, to come talk about this. But I also have to say it's a lot of fun to compare it to science fiction uh-huh. because that's what we're, that's what we're used to comparing because it with. because science fiction spurs so much of what we have yeah. in today's society, like the tricorder from Star Trek. Schweitzer. Dude, dude, it's fucking right here. It's called your iPhone and the medical devices it connects to. Uh, transparent aluminum. You guys remember that? Yeah. One of the Star Trek movies? It exists. Yep. Yes, I do. Yep. Scientists created it. I, I don't think he had a, clear. I don't think he had a name. I think the actor is Robert Bernard. He didn't have a name. It's, he gave himself a name on season one, episode 12, and he called himself Schweitzer. Schweitzer. But in mostly he's credited he's as the doctor. doctor. Yep. Yeah, and, he doesn't have a name. And, and and part of the only reason why I bring this up is because one of the episodes that we saw recently is that he wrote, the doctor wrote a novel, a holo novel, and it went to a publisher. And the holo novel was based on what had happened on Voyager with a little spin And it kind of talked bad about what happened on the ship and they violated the prime directive and all this type of stuff. And, you know, like, you know, (laughs) they, they, the names were just slightly off. And when it went to, when it went to press effectively, it was, this is only a draft version. You can't publish this. And the publisher published it and they went to sue the publisher to retract it. And the publisher said, what are you talking about? This is a hologram that has no rights and has no sentience. When in fact the hologram had read, effectively written its own sentience program and its emotions and been and expanded and was far greater than what they understood uh, in the Alpha Quadrant, what had actually become in the Delta Quadrant. Now we're now we're going into the Twilight Zone. Yes. The Star Trek. Yes. <laughs> what other stories we got? Oh, we have stories. Yeah, we do. Oh, do we, we have, have stories? stories to burn. We do. And then some. Um, oh, hackers win $105,000 for reporting critical security flaws in Sonos One yep. speakers. You, you and Sam both had that one. Yes. So I was intrigued by this article. What? On the speaker, there exists a daemon named Anna Kappa, Anna Kappa D. Anna Kappa D. That handles all Sonos specific functions, including accessing music services, LED control, and audio playback. The vulnerability exists in the way Anna Kappa D handles SMB V2 replies from the server. And I'm like, why do you why do you need SMB V2? Like what engineering decisions went into designing Sonos such that you're gonna use SMB V2? Now I use Sonos. Uh-huh. Yeah, I just want to say from like a user perspective, at least in the versions that I have, there was no like I upload all of my files to like a thing. Maybe they have that product and, and that's where the vulnerability mm-hmm. is. But like when I did Sonos, do some I still have some of the Sonos devices today, like they're just they're speakers that are on the network. Yep. Right. So you can right. So how do they access stream content? Music stuff to them. I guess it's SMB, but like I, there was no in the systems I have anyway. There was no storage component, right? But what if it. you? But and I'm and I don't have Sonos, but what if you were to say? I remember there were some Sonos devices that had a screen that you could use to access streaming services. And what if you had a NAS, like a Drobo, that you had a shit ton of music on that had a Samba share that you could use to gain access to the Samba share with your Sonos that way. Mm. To me, that would make sense for SMB V2 or Samba to be on there because I know we, over the times of us navigating the whole home automation stuff is that I've got this massive library for us stuff of Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. video and audio that quite honestly, I've just sort of been hoarding and I don't know if I have applications on any one of my devices that I could actually use to access it with. Wait, so you're saying you need like a... Music streaming. Yeah, like like right, if, now but, we're deviating but, from cybersecurity, but but, but no, really... no, I'm I'm but I'm trying to tie this back to the SMB yeah. too that I could enable that disc where I've got all this media over the network via Windows File Share, right? And then my TV with an app, say like Plex or whatever, whatever we were talking about the Megabone Black mm-hmm. years ago when like could access. That stuff over right. at SMB Share. Yep. 
this makes sense to me why this would be on a Sonos device. I seem to recall many years ago having a media player that would use SMB or yep. Samba to access the content that it would then play for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, but that was a long time ago. Yep. Yeah, there's uh there's Rune and there's um. Mm. So quite honestly, the, one on the, the, the place I'd be playing it would be on one of my Amazon Fire Sticks or on my Android-based television that you can install apps on. Right. I just, I don't know. I and I could probably do it. I just it's unfortunate the that they chose SMB because it, it led to yeah. what I believe was a buffer overflow. Yeah. Yep. Also, I think Sonos kind of has a... Leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Sure. Because they did the whole, uh, the previous devices are no longer supported. We're not giving you any updates yep. for them. All right. Th this was a while ago, but oh, yeah, I remember jerks. That. Yep. And I, I ripped out a whole bunch of Sonos gear, except for some that. of my newer, I, I, I have one, I think one, one left. And there, and there, became, and it's like mounted to a wall and stuff and like the, that. And, the, and, and I'm like, uh, and there became a cottage industry of those things that got ripped out for people hacking those. Yeah. To yeah. Open source stuff on them. They really screwed themselves yep. like some large product companies have done in recent times like like one from a couple weeks uh, from one last week ago was the uh the belkin wemo smart yeah. plugs yeah i was gonna say what about wemo didn't they do the same thing they kind of did like yeah we're not gonna fix this shit because it's been end of or we're going to end of life it already is end of life and well and i, I like don't piss off your customers and, and I, it's really and, like and it's I, not is it that yeah. hard to not piss off your customers yep. and i and i social media about all of that with the 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 official post from the, the folks that it's secure and that did it and mm -hmm. while we haven't seen an official response from belkin the folks the researchers from secure and said that belkin has backtracked and that they will be issuing patches mm. so proof is in the pudding I'll, Show me the money. So my dollar, question dollar is, oh, bills you, get, you, get, you get Belkin, you get a Sonos, which is basically a, a Joe, Joe Random user facing, not a business or professional targeted market. You should, you're going to have to find ways to tell the consumer that it's end of life. You can't just like stop supporting it. Mm -hmm. you know, you know the, we, they both have apps. The apps could say, you know, you got an old device. We're going to stop supporting it in a couple of years, trade it in for a credit or something. Yep. I mean, yeah, it's still unsupported, but at least you gave the user some guidance and you were nice to them. Yep. I mean, so what? You give them 50 bucks off. Big deal, yep. right? Ad admittedly, or, Lee, they'd have to be, uh, and I'd argue they'd have to be fairly advanced in how they chose to develop their mobile app because mm -hmm. i think about this wemo stuff i have probably eight or nine of those affected wemo plugs in my home mm -hmm. and i use them fairly regularly um yep. and i can't remember the last time i fired up the app because they are working they're connected to my amazon echo mm. and i tell the echo to turn something on and turn something on like Mm -hmm. I don't need to go into the app. And unless the app tells me there's an update for this stuff, mm -hmm. I don't update this stuff, whether it be the app itself or the firmware on the device. You know, it's interesting, though. The apps ha either don't support it or have to be configured to allow to you uh, notifications. Yep. Which means it always has to be running in the background. Talk to mm -hmm. who makes Wemo, Belkin. Belkin, yep. Belkin, and go, hey, there's a firmware update. So, like... yep. And you, I feel like it should have that, like whether because there's other ways to control these devices other than the app mm -hmm. from the manufacturer. But mm -hmm. I mean, also you're on the flip side of your security, um, you, you know, posture is I don't want a million apps running in the background collecting all stuff, and I don't want a million apps on my phone because mm -hmm. it's just open to my attack service. But like in this case. You have to be running the app. It has to be running in the background. It has to send you notifications yep. to go, it, hey, you should update firmware. It, I had the same problem with my Hue stuff. Like Hue, I have to go in and like go check like all their firmware updates. Like there's no Yep, there, there's no push. Well, I mean, there might be a push, but what what happened when you installed it? Like, would you like to receive push notifications from the app? Yeah. Oh, fuck no. Right. I get enough notifications as it is. Like like the bell. But with stuff. like with the Tesla though, it sends me notifications that there's a firmware update. Which you probably opted in. Which I probably opted into purposely because yep. I wanted. I'm like, I, yes, I want but, the firmware but updates. But like, if you think about it, you know got, why? Because I want the freaking auto park in the auto summon thing, 
which is being pushed as a firmware update at some point. Right, because you have a vested interest in getting those notifications. Well, but it, it, Tesla, but do you, Tesla does the fucking shitty thing where they're, you know, you pay for the option, but you mm -hmm. don't have the option until they push the firmware right. update. But and once they pay for the option, if I sell the car, I can't transfer it. Yep. That's where I forget his name, Flying Penguin guy. What's his name? Uh, he was trashing Tesla, and like I get that, but right, it's right. also a really cool car, and I like driving it. So there. But you go. but but think about this. Now you have a dozen apps on your phone between your Echo, yeah. your Sonos, your Belkin your Netgear, your cameras that all want to send you push notifications that like, no, shut that, shut up. Like, I don't want to mm -hmm. wake up in the morning and go get my phone off the charger and there's 30 notifications from shit that like, I got to go update my stuff. No, I don't want to know about that. Like, stop. Mm. Or some, or yeah. like most people, my phone is on a separate floor in most cases, so I don't get those notifications until I get up. But some people plug that shit in right next to their bed on the nightstand. And right. all night. No. How you sleep with the phone right next to you? Or it's in a different part. Of, it's a completely different part of the house. Yep. Like you. I, I, you know, like, like Lee, I, unplug. Lee, I will tell you, like I had, I had to disable a whole bunch of shit because due to my surgery, I spent the last five weeks sleeping in a recliner with my phone next to me because it was oh. accessible and it was charging because that was my alarm clock. And yeah. Yeah. Yep. Ouch. I have I have friends on other time zones that would text me at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> well, mm. and I'd respond, of course. But right. Moving well, along. Sounds sounds like a personal problem. It does. It sounds like a me problem. I, I want to talk about Lee's story number five. Yeah. Yeah. Sports warehouse. Set us. It, so, it's another PCI story. Go ahead, Lee. It Set is. us up. Yeah. Cool. There's actually one of three stories where New York put fines on the company for getting cyber wrong. But I thought Jeff would appreciate this, that they had they had a system penetrated that had credit card information back to 2002 that was unencrypted and, of course, downloaded. And mm -hmm. I'm, I was imagining Jeff cringing as he read this story because it's just wrong in so many ways. Um, and then what did they do? They... they uh, the court has a plan for them to that they have to adhere to 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 tighten up their stuff, and I'm thinking, follow frickin' PCI DSS. Let's get this together. And why the hell are you storing credit cards indefinitely? That just seems bad. Um, I yeah, thought you weren't so supposed I, to do that, Jeff. Well, <clears throat> yeah. I, I mean, if the article is true, um, they were not only storing credit card numbers, but also CVV, the security codes. Yes. <sighs> Which tells me that they were doing. They were not PCI compliant. There are well, but there are there are merchant, mm. there are retailers, so they were subject. They've been subject to PCI. What I'm getting from this is including the the keyword tags at the bottom of the article. One of which is card not present fraud. Is that they? My guess is this was a um, you know a repeat customer database where you could enter your your credit card information. Yep. Um, and so they had, you know, repository now, like it's rare, but I have an Amex card that is the same card number that I've had for probably 25 years. So it's possible that, you know, I, I you know, like the rental car company, the, that I use the hotel that I use has had my credit card information stored in, you know, do you want to keep your card on file? Uh, that it's possible to keep that for as, as many as 20 years that that's mm. possible um they should not have had the security code the cvv that's that's a i could see the justification because the pci requirement is you're not allowed to retain the cvv post authorization oh so i could see somebody making the argument well we haven't made a transaction yet we're just keeping it on file so that we can run it but you're not supposed to do that. Mm. Um, so, Jeff, would this be a case where the EMV token would come into play? Not really, because the EMV tokens are designed to present cloning of cards. You know, okay. it's it's been yeah. it's been it's been long regarded as irrelevant when it comes to card not present. You know, e-commerce transactions. Yep. You know, right. buying something from a website. Um, but the, the you know the the overhaul that they have at the bottom of the article and they have a bullet list of things that they yeah. promise to start doing 
encrypting all private information it collects. Yeah, that's PCI requirement number three. They should have already been doing that. Enf enforcing strong password picking policies for users. Also a long standing PCI requirement, requirement eight. Hashing and salting all stored passwords using reasonable standards. Requirement eight. Running all anti-malware tools, requirement five. Logging network activity and monitoring it for signs of, signs of suspicious behavior. That's requirement 10. Conducting regular penetration testing and vulnerability remediation reviews. That's requirement 11. Detecting personally, uh, deleting personally. Is that 11.1 or 11.3? Uh, it changes in version four. It, oh, it was, throw me through a it, loop. I had it memorized. I thought. Well, it was eleven dot three. Mm. Yeah, in in uh, you know up until in three, when oh, version yeah. four kicks in, and then the, I don't have the new number mm. numbering memorized. But deleting deleting personally identifiable identifiable sensitive information in a timely manner, unless there's a compelling business or legal reason to retain it. If they've got a subscriber database, uh, you know they're they're going to keep that data indefinitely. Yeah, so that one's a little bit of you know fudge. I mean, it goes back to requirement three. You're supposed to have a policy that says we retain data for so long, and then we just you know securely delete it, securely destroy it. Correct. I I just the only way I can under believe that they've gotten away with not doing these things for so long is that they were perhaps self-reporting, uh, you know, doing the self-assessment questionnaire, and they just didn't get it. I mean, the fact that they're talking about 20 years worth of data and they only compromised 1.8 million customers, maybe they were doing self-assessment questionnaires, but I'd be like, I'd be going after their QSA company because there's no way that those guys, if they're not doing all these things, hadn't been doing all these things, are PCI compliant. So, I I haven't read read the article in a little bit, but my thought was. Were they even doing anything with PSI? Were they just taking a full-on pass and hoping nobody would notice? Well, if if you're not a level one merchant and you're not having to hire a QSA, um, and that's one of the problems of the PCI program is, yeah, you're largely ignored because the, the paradigm used to be that the bad guys were going to go after the big merchants that uh, had the tens of millions of cards, you know, the TGX companies, mm. the Hannafords, the Targets, the Home Depots, right. and not bother with the little guys. So, yeah, there there is the possibility that nobody is really paying attention to it. I'm surprised that the fine is, is as small as it was. Uh, they got yeah. off really easy, especially if they were storing the, the CVVs. That's oh, supposed yeah. to be, you um, know, there, there was a point in time in the in the PCI history where if you were, caught retaining cvv you were you were subject to a fine of ten thousand dollars per instance Oof, per, so, per cvv how per cvv wow so yeah this yeah. is this is a very, very peculiar article and it underscores one of the issues with pci which is that the focus is usually on the 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 one percent the big the big players and the 99 percent nobody's really monitoring them nobody's nobody's watching the hen house in the in these instances until something bad happens i see what you're looking like their payment right processor now. is the one who no detected the fraudulent activity and turned and effectively turned them in um and that's I mean, well that's very that's very sam's got to come, come, come in here so i just I, I looked up i see what you're saying you have to process more than six million transactions a year to have any kind of external validation of your compliance Otherwise, it's just well, self-assessment. Hmm. I was unaware it, that PCI was that weak. Yeah, Sam, I think there are correct it, phrases. It's six, I, I, it's six I, million I, Visa transactions, hmm. not Sam, credit card transactions. Sam, I think six the correct phrase hold here on, is... Hold on, Jeff was making a distinction yeah. there. Oh, hold on. I think that... Is, but for Sam, I think that the correct phrase is, I smell what you've been stepping in. Yeah. Smell you and stepping in, dude. <laughs> Love that phrase. <laughs> See what you're saying. I smell no. what you've been stepping in, right? But Jeff, you're saying that PCI specifically calls out Visa transactions? Well, no. I, I mean, the whole credit card security thing started with all the card brands had their own set of requirements, and for oh. Visa, it was six million Visa transactions a year. You were you were subject to having a QS come in, or they 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 had a different name for us back mm -hmm. then. Um, Mastercard, it was five million. They put you into the level one merchant status. Mm -hmm. What PCI did was, you know, the card brands got that, together yeah. and said. 
okay, we'll agree to this common set of standards. Five but and the, a half million. Call it a split. Well, no, yeah, it, it, yeah. it's, it's it is still today. what to is it today? Day, it's whatever. Today, it's v, it's Visa transactions, six million makes you a level one. Mm-hmm. Mastercard, it's five million. Uh, American Express, Discover, uh, I you know they basically say you know X number of million transactions, or if you qualify for one of the other card brands being level one type mm-hmm. of. Thing. Oh, I see. Now I don't know what the numbers are today, but you know in in the early days. Visa owned roughly 60% of the credit card market. So you huh. could extrapolate up and say 6 million Visa transactions, roughly 10 million trans- credit card transactions a year. That's still the number I go by. It, you know, it's, it's a rough number. But the acquiring banks, the bank of the merchants, are the ones that determine the level and tell you, okay, you're, you're our merchant. You need to go hire a QSA, and we want to see your rock in your attestation of compliance. So this means that practically every retail store you go to, PCI has done nothing at all. They just have to fill out a form. Um, For the little guys, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there there are... No, for the little guys, it absolutely is a stick to say you should not store cardholder data. I'm not sure what what the stick is, Jeff, but I know from researching this topic... It makes sure that, like, the pizza place down the street that was storing every mm-hmm. single credit card transaction that it got since 1993, mm-hmm. and right. someone like Max Vision broke in and stole all those credit, yep. credit cards and installed a skimmer on it, that made it so that there was a penalty if they did that, or enough of a fear of a penalty where your small mom and pop shop, Sam, were like, I don't want to store any of that crap. I mean, similar to GDPR, but not effective in improving everyone's overall cybersecurity posture, but making it so like, oh, I really shouldn't, I don't want to store credit card data, hands off that shit. You know? so, and, and related, I had this this happen recently, as some of our listeners may have seen on my either Instagram or Facebook. We're having a bunch of work done around the house, and mm-hmm. we're having an outdoor kitchen built, and as part of that, the contractors that are building the outdoor kitchen said, hey, we're going to go down to this local lumber yard and we're going to order some stuff. We've got a PO right here mm-hmm. type of thing. We've done the research. This is what it's going to be. We're going to go down to the lumber yard and uh, we'll call you from the lumber yard and we'll put you on the phone with the mm-hmm. the the contractor folks and we'll th- you give, give them your credit, credit card, card on the phone. Pay for it. Yeah. Yep. And <laughs> Mike, cool. That's fine. I, I get it. And they, uh, the first transaction was Okay, cool. Uh, hold on a second. Let me write this down. Mm. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> yep. So I, pulled, I I put that credit card away from my wallet. I pulled out a different credit card that mm-hmm, didn't have right. as high of a limit because <laughs> I knew how much it was going to be and gave them that, quote, throwaway credit card from a different end right. with the lower limit. And like, yeah. Hey, yeah. let me write that down. I, oh, at the ri- uh, You know, I'm, I don't want to... <laughs> sound like i'm throwing my wife under the bus but you know she uses our our common credit card yeah which happens to be a master card uh she uses it buying lots of different things lots of different online sites and you know organizations that are typically the smaller merchants sure that may not have the attention to detail we've had our uh, our, our mastercard replaced in the last 10 i was at a client site many years ago where I got notice that our card had been compromised oh. and I pulled the card out of my wallet. How ironic is like, that? You're doing a QSA assessment and you get Well, it. and it, it was a company that had gone through a, ma- they'd had a major breach and they were, they, you know, they were getting religion. They were, they were paying a lot of attention right. then. And I pulled the card out of my wallet and I said, why don't you keep this card? Cause I'm pretty sure you guys are the reason why it's been uh, compromised. Uh, uh, right. Uh, and uh, and uh, you can, you can hang on to it, you know, you know, six months, a year from now when you're going around telling, you know, the war stories and lessons learned presentations. You can use this as an example. Um, yeah, but, so you know, I was we've just going to say, I would just want to go back to Sam's point because hmm? it's validation from what Jeff was saying. And what I learned is that PCI is a data security standard. And I think one of the shining winning things for PCI is it made merchants realize I don't want to store that data which oh, by nature helped secure that data so that it wasn't as much of a commodity and easily accessible 
to attackers who largely shifted. I'm not saying it, it's down to zero. It's back to our safety conversation, right? It's not down to zero, but largely shifted to cryptocurrency mining, um, trading PII, and, and other things because it made it much harder to just come across yep. credit card numbers. Sam, so did, I mean, did I bring you around on the PCI so far? No. <laughs> I'm not convinced. Good. I mean, somebody awesome. sent them a form and said, you should be encrypting this stuff. You shouldn't be storing it. But nobody ever inspected them. So isn't it there they're is just going to no treat this by. as another meaningless bit of paperwork? I mean. But the. I, the also, yes, but it has been the problem for a met for many, you know. It just strictly in terms of the numbers, I mean, it's it's. But it's I think it's the penalty. But it's the penalty. I mean, I've personally worked with smaller and, merchants and much, that are like, I know yeah. I could lie in this form, but the the repercussions are, I could have some serious fines, which could almost like put me out of like that could be a bad day. So they're like, um, Paul, Jeff, can you help me just be compliant? I'm like, yeah, like don't store any of that stuff or like outsource it to Stripe <laughs> or whatever, so you well, don't have to worry ones, about it. Those are the ones smart enough to hire you. But no, I mean, they didn't hire. They, I didn't get paid for any of that work. I mean, Jeff they don't, didn't get paid but for the that small work, merchants but. don't have to hire anybody. They, no, they, they just gotta they don't read the thing. I mean, yeah. yeah. In in the PCI ecosystem, the security expert is the QSA. They're the ones that are looked to to provide interpretation and clarification and understanding. And you know, as the article that we talked about some time ago, you know, building it into your business processes or building your business processes into PCI. You know the people that can guide you are the QSA, but 99% of companies out there don't have to hire a QSA. And it's not just the mom and pop pizza places, you know, think muni municip yeah, municipal, sure, anyway. yeah. uh, you know, I have a client right now that's a city um, and, and they, you know, they're small in, in terms of their budget and their infrastructure, but they're subject to PCI just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Um, the in the early days, Paul, card data was everywhere. Mm, and yes. and 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 to this day, segmentation, which was the first trick, mm -hmm. as Larry was alluding to <laughs> earlier, yeah. of limiting scope. Nope. What well, you mean if I don't have card data in this section of my network, I don't have to I don't have to subject it to the assessment, which I always interpreted as oh, I don't so need you're to not secure doing it. security mm -hmm. over there. Um Put yeah. it this way, Sam, the PCI has raised awareness so much that the cigar lounges that I belong to that have a yearly <laughs> subscription you pay once a year are like, no, 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 I'm not storing your credit card information once a right. year when you come in or I'm going to send you a text message that you have to come in and you have to give me your credit card again and we have to process the transaction again. That's the level of awareness that PCI created for smaller merchants, not level one merchants, right? That... I think led to the diminishing value and increasing data security that the PCI provided. Yeah, I agree with you, Paul. And and just to, to clarify that, it, it's a matter of in the early days, card data was everywhere, and everybody kept all their yeah, sales dude, like, tracks, yeah, transactions. The, yeah, they were if, right. financial records that they had to keep for seven right. years. They were financial records, mm -hmm. and it was transaction data that had all the card data on it. Because in the early days, you may not, you may remember this. You used to have your card data. Your card number was printed on your receipt. And then right, they yep. start. Was there even a CVV? PCI came along. Was there always a CVV? I feel like there was a time there there's wasn't. Always been, no. no, there's always been a CVV. There's always been a CVV? Okay. But that's used, that's used mostly for card not present. So that was the e-commerce thing. How do we know it's your card? How do you know it's a real You've card and you just haven't code. stolen the number? You've got the card that's only printed on the back of the card. Right. Which is why you're not allowed to store it anywhere because you don't want the bad mm -hmm. guys to steal the credit card, yep. the expiration and the CVV. Yeah. But, hey. you know, so the, the segmentation thing started get started people thinking, well, where, you know, if you're going to isolate sections of your network, you got to know where all the credit card data was. And it was everywhere. So they, you know, and this is a years long process where people started pulling the, discovering where all the data was and pulling it into the, the, the smallest number of places in their network so they could isolate it, which was a good thing because it was reducing the footprint. And then somebody had the, why are we keeping this data in the first? first place and then they started eliminating it wholesale and that's been you know they didn't do it necessarily for the right reasons from a security perspective but the the upshot has been 
you know, the, most of the m- l- large retailers, many, many more companies these days, merchants, are not storing, storing the data in the first place, so the data is not there to be stolen. Yep. Hey, but, I, you know, Target... Yeah. Sam, Sam needs to leave right about now, so <laughs> one, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to say goodbye. Yeah, we're going okay. long. And, yeah, and, yeah. and two, I was hoping we could finish out with one last story of mine. Yeah, let's do it. And that is my story Good. number one. Atlanta's okay. anonymous boot girls will remove a boot on your car oh, for fifty bucks. I wanted to. Oh yeah. yes, that's yeah, that's <laughs> and, a good last story. And uh, Adrian Sanabria wanted us to cover this one too. He, he motioned. He's like, "How are they doing this?" I'm like, it's a, a single set of keys that is used throughout Buckhead. Um, <laughs> so effectively, what happened here is that um, a couple of women who uh, go uh, anonymous, uh, known as Boot Shiesty, and one other name, and I can't remember the other name here. Um, They effectively quit their day jobs as hairstylists because they had obtained the overall effective skeleton key for the boots for um, uh, Buckhead County, Buckhead. And I keep reading Buckhead as Buckethead. So, um, so... They do about 40 jobs per day, unlocking boots for 50 bucks. So that's $2,000 a day. That's pretty good. By unlocking yeah. boots with the skeleton key that they purchased offline for like $40. So wait, that's hilarious. This, that's is hilarious. A, this is a, let's put the legality aside. Yep. It's called Boot Girls. Are these, are these women? Is that what yep. they, they two created? Women. The, two, yeah. two women. You yep. created this company that created know this how company, to, company, right? Company, they can bypass a boot and... They do how many? Two thousand a day. Four hundred a day. Sorry, forty <laughs> jobs per day at fifty dollars a piece. Forty jobs a day. There's, yeah, so there's two 50. of them. So they're each doing twenty jobs a day at fifty bucks. So you're saying it's two grand a day. Yep. Yep. Wow. So and, it's and they quit their jobs as hairstylists. Fourteen a week. Twenty-eight. I'm forty. Flashing 50, back 50 to being something a grand. Fifty-six thousand. How many 50, cars that were booted? 30? I saw. Holy crap! What is that like? Fifty grand a month. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so if they're each doing, uh, help so me out the math each, here. So forty jobs per day at fifty dollars a piece is two grand per day. If they, if they, if they split seven that, days a, a week. It's a thousand dollars a day. Yeah, so let's say seven days a week, because they could get called at any time. Come on, boot my car. So so thirty thousand dollars each is sixty thousand uh, uh, dollars a month. Uh, so seven days a week, three hundred and sixty-five days a year, a thousand dollars a day. So they each get three hundred sixty-five thousand well, dollars. They could a year. effectively, yeah, three hundred sixty-five thousand dollars a day at fifty dollars well, a piece. Round it down. The average twenty two thousand and eighty hour full time person yep. is working two hundred sixty days a year. So even if they're only working yeah, like a regular sure. nine to five kind of job, it's two hundred sixty grand. Yep. By Not unlocking bad. unlocking boots with a key that they obtained from um, the uh, web uh, website, the owner of ATL boot key. But now, now let's go to legality part of that. Yep. Obviously it's, there's it's a reason, shady. there's a reason why they remain anonymous and they wear masks and they refer to themselves as boot shiesty. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. What law are they actually breaking? Ooh, that's a good question. Is there a, law that if your car has a boot on it and you bypass it is that it must be some kind of misdemeanor jeff right Mm -hmm. there's probably there's probably a law that says you're not allowed to tamper with it or try to remove it but having a third party having a third party do it Mm. and it probably heavily so i love this it depends because it's very much it applies to uefi firmware stuff and boots on cars and in various laws in your county city and state probably not federal yeah. legislation on this but i think that there is probably state and or city and town legislation that differs per state and per mm-hmm. city or town that dictates exactly if that violates the law and how and what the penalty is uh for it yeah so it probably depends on when they're where they're operating as to what the laws are and how those laws are written and if there's any loopholes like larry said you're not maybe the law's written that you are not you the owner of the vehicle are not allowed to tamper with and or disable a boot but that leaves the loophole for the third party to come in 
and do mm-hmm. it. And then yep. the onus of the law after that would be on the person that has the boot that has to pay their parking tickets, basically, right? Right. I figure the bigger biggest risk for them if they get caught is from the people that install boots it might inter- have a little bit of street level justice in terms of response, both versus legal. Um, yeah. Well, also, yeah. I mean, they have to get caught doing it as well, like well, removing yeah. the boot. The, so, the, so there in Georgia, Google says it's it is not illegal to purchase a boot key. However, removing a boot on your own is illegal if you're not permitted and licensed to do so. Hmm. But you're not removing it on your own. You're paying a third party to do so. There's probably a little bit of a mm, could be a loophole. Mm. Or I don't think. A, a, I don't think. Or maybe they there. just don't. Maybe they just don't need. They they shouldn't get caught. Yep. So the, if you go to their Instagram page, it's Boot Girls and Buckhead, and uh, they, they, their, uh, their, their little description there is: we can take that shit off. Team fucked up boots and call team call our lawyer. <laughs> yeah, but uh, okay. and, so they and, they're aware of whatever loopholes there yep, are. And also, when I looked at this, it says followed by Sawaba, mm. <laughs> which is Sinatra. Yeah, it's Adrian. <laughs> um, Yep. What was I going to well, say? And, but and, but you know what's interesting ahead. is that uh, if 40 boots a day, how many cars are getting booted a, in that, Georgia? A, that that is a a lot. At, no, not, not in Georgia. Atlanta. In Atlanta. In Atlanta. I can Great, see that, though. I mean, Atlanta's Atlanta. a very highly populated, densely populated city. A lot of traffic. Yes. Uh, probably has a parking problem exponentially greater than many other cities in the United States, maybe the world. Uh, opening up this market, I get. I mean, I give them credit. I wouldn't invest in the company because of the legality, but yep. I give them a. I give them a lot of credit, man. Like you know, you go girl, <laughs> go girls. You go, you go boot girl, right? Yep. You go boot girl. It's, it's a pair of them, a pair of them. <laughs> yeah. All right, but, that's a fitting, fitting, fitting. It, it is well, a fitting. The legislature ending. wants to get ban booting in Georgia. Wow, that would kill their. Oh, that would kill their business model. Then what are they gonna do? They'll, but, but they are, they're going to sell the, fake the, parking tickets. These two women are enterprising enough to go quit their day jobs as stylists to go do this at 200 at the They got to have a contingency plan. They got to be like, if they ban booting, we've already they, got a backup plan. They're working you, on another business. If they, if they don't oh, have a contingency yeah. plan, these are smart. They're going to, they're going to pick themselves up from the boots, bootstraps and go on to the next thing. And even go if, on to the next thing. Even and if, if the next is, thing is more like, even, doesn't have even, these legal issues, I'm investing. I'm even if saying. that is going back. <laughs> Being hairstylists could be, I would and I would invest in that because yep. they were very in, in creative, innovative, and uh, good business I people. Wonder, I wonder if we can boot, boot chase the inner partner on the show. Yeah, <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> that, be I mean, because they're hackers, they're hackers, man. They, they they're are. hackers. They, they are. are. It, it all, I, you know, I'm, you know, there's a Reddit page that talks about how illegal is it to remove private car boot, and mm. you know, so that implies that it's not just the city, it's not just Mm. You know the government, city government, or whatever that's putting the boots on. You know, it, maybe it's like a private parking companies. lot or, or, yep. or you know, oh, okay. private companies that are right. the boots for whatever reason. Um, yeah, it, it it's fascinating, and I'm not going to rent a car the next time I go to Atlanta just to be on the safe side. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to Uber. I'm going to Uber. Yep. Well, that concludes yep. All right, this let's... edition of Paul Security Weekly. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. Larry, take us out. Over in. Oh, my God. Can you see the pixels? Wow. That's low resolution. Out. Thanks, Darth Vader.